us in the studio to tell us what all this means for Singapore and Singaporeans. Uh, joining us this afternoon, Selena Ling, Chief Economist and Head of Global Markets Research and Strategy at OCBC, and Ang Yit, President of the Association of Small and Medium Enterprises. And we'll share the discussion with my colleague, Glenda Chong. Glenda. All right, thanks, Don, for that. And joining me here is Associate Professor Walter Tessera from the School of Business at Singapore University of Social Sciences and Keithana Lechmi, President of the National Trades Union Congress. We'll track all the reactions and analysis to Budget 2024. We begin at Parliament House, where all the action will be happening. Our reporters there are keeping a close eye on key aspects of this year's budget. Clara Lee looking at support for workers and businesses. And Rebecca Mateo on measures helping families and individuals. Clara tells us what we can look forward to. This is one of the most important events in the calendar, as the government unveils its spending plans and priorities for the year. Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Lawrence Wong will be delivering the speech, and he's no stranger to the task. In fact, this is his third time making the address, but this time is especially significant. For one, Mr Wong is set to take over the reins from Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong later this year, and Budget 2024 may well set the tone for the priorities of the 4G leaders. Analysts expect this to address issues such as the rising costs of living, which has been weighing down on the minds of Singaporeans. That's despite the central bank tightening monetary policy and rounds of government payouts to help Singaporeans ease some of the pressure. On the jobs front, retrenchment numbers more than doubled last year, and the labour movement is urging for more measures to help such displaced workers. These include upskilling credits and temporary support until they find a new job. Businesses are also hoping for more fiscal support amid rising operational costs. They're also concerned about cybersecurity threats, emerging tech like artificial intelligence, and increased expectations on corporate governance. These continue to cloud their outlook for this year. Keeping inflation under control is an issue that governments around the world, including Singapore, have been trying to tackle. The previous two budgets saw measures to curb rising costs of living. So let's take a look at how numbers have played out over the years. The growth of consumer prices went from as low as 0.6 percent. That was in 2019 to a pandemic high of 6.1 percent in 2022. Prices then climbed at a slower pace in 2023. Core inflation, which excludes accommodation and transport, grew sharply in 2022 before moderating in 2023. The government had said that if the central bank hadn't tightened monetary policy, these numbers would have been worse. And looking close at just the last two years, the rate of increase, it seems to have slowed. Different income groups, though, are also affected differently. The higher income group was hit more than those with lower incomes. Rising prices were also more acutely felt, depending on where people typically spent their cash in 2023. The top four contributors to inflation for households, or well, they are housing and utilities, food, transport and recreation, and culture, which includes travel expenses. Uh, it wasn't just prices that grew, though. Those salaries, they went up as well. The median gross monthly income of full-time employed residents rose steadily from $4,563, that was in 2019, to $5,197 in 2023. In terms of percentage increases, annual wages grew from 3.9% in 2019 to a decade high of 6.5% in 2022. But... It is a different picture when you take into account inflation. Real incomes, they went from 3.3% in 2019 to a mere 0.4% in 2022. Selena, I want to get to you first with this because the finance minister has said that this budget is going to be the first instalment that ensures the future of Singapore. Inflation has taken a bit of a hit 
it seems to have tapered, but at the same time, when you're looking at that sticker price mm -hmm. at the shop or as a business, you basically, you know, you might get a bit of a shock at the till. Is it something that we should be concerned about? Well, inflation, I think, is a little bit of a perennial issue for most central banks. Um, inflation is really the rate of increase. So although inflation is slowing, it just means that prices are going up at a slower pace compared to the last two, three years, right? But it is still going up. And I think the reality is we're not returning to the pre-COVID type of environment where inflation was very low, sub 1% to 2%. I think for this year, we are expecting both headline and core inflation to be growing north of 3%. So if the growth environment is one where GDP growth is slowing, there's a little bit of external headwinds, then you could actually have a scenario where the nominal wage growth doesn't keep pace with inflation. That would mean that your real income growth could actually fall. So that's going to be an issue, I think, in particular for some of the lower wage uh, households that will still be grappling with you know, inflation. Angyut, let's bring you in on the conversation. Now, and to be clear, there are cushioning measures that are in place as far as higher costs are concerned for businesses, for local enterprises. Uh, we have had some time to adjust, taking those measures into account. Uh, but how far have, have those higher costs been perhaps more, of, more than a psychological pinch for businesses to cope with? Yeah, so I think for businesses, there are a few areas that we want to be careful or worried about. First is really the manpower costs. Manpower is a very big factor of production for most businesses. And um, the manpower costs, together with the availability of manpower, the ease of finding manpower, all that will contribute to the business costs. And that's an area that uh, many businesses will tell you they're they are facing some challenges. Uh, the second area is uh, costs generally energy costs, right? And uh, like last year, towards the end of last year, we still saw the increase in uh, gas prices. And that all adds to the, the cost of businesses. And the thing about SMEs is that they would likely uh, cushion some of this cost internally. But the moment they, they can't handle the cost increase, they would then increase their prices and that would impact everyone else. Mm. And uh, the other part is really about transformation, right? Um, many of them are trying to transform. And the support given, you know, whether that's adequate to deal with the, the work that's necessary to transform is something that we continue, it's a continuing process, and we hope that that's something that can be dealt with in this budget. Mm. It is a real concern, uh, and it does have an impact, and it impacts almost every sector. Selena, uh, when it comes to persistent inflation, it does impact value as well and, and opportunities for growth. I mean, you were talking earlier about that, about uh, the revenue streams perhaps that, uh, that companies can actually find. What does that inflation mean for growth in 2024 for Singapore? Well, we are expecting that GDP growth this year should improve modestly um, to around 2% compared to around 1.1% last year. But I guess at the end of the day, it's a very uneven sectoral mix. We are expecting manufacturing to recover slightly because of the hopes that the global semiconductor demand is picking up. But if you look within services itself, um, some of it is doing a little bit better. Those that uh, you know, are related to tourism and also consumption-wise. But we are also seeing signs of a slowdown in other areas. So outside of finance and insurance, for instance, some of the professional services, because of the uh, you know, caution that we are seeing on the business sentiments front, mm. actually we have seen a tapering off in terms of growth momentum for the sectors. So I think net-net, you know, it's uh, two sides of the same coin, right? You have yeah. growth on one end, what is the demand for your goods and services, but on the flip side really is your cost of doing business. And you need both to be in sync in order to be profitable. Well, in the mind of Singaporeans as well, when, you, when they see prices going up, the, the feeling is, am I earning more money as well, right? And companies are cognizant of that. Companies know that their, their staff, their, their talent pool are also thinking, well, perhaps I can get a little bit more. Perhaps there will be a salary increment. When it comes to those businesses, Ang Yut, uh, it, they don't. Do they have a choice? I mean, they, when they look at the the uh, expectations of their staff pool, SBF, the Singapore Business Federation, said that they anticipated that employers would increase. The majority would increase those salaries in 2024. Is that still likely? Okay. So what we are looking at for businesses is two parts, right? 
Last year, there was a lot of uh, salary increases and what we call musical chairs as people move from business to businesses. And, and that's, that's really one of the big challenge for business to retrain, lose someone that you train and then having to train again. That's a lot of costs. And that, towards the tail end of 2023, most businesses kind of reach a point of stability. And that, that's why they are a bit concerned if costs continue to creep up because then they will have to do another round of adjustment and, and work on talent retention. So that's one part, right? The other part is whether the economy is doing well. And by most measures in Q4 last year and the projection so far in 2024, uh, the economy isn't so great for the majority of the businesses. And that's a big concern because if you can't bring in enough revenue, then no matter how the cost demands, you, you will not be able to pay the salary that your employers employees are asking for. So for businesses, they are stuck between these two challenges uh, as of now in this current climate. Yeah, it's, there's a lot to balance. Uh, and I'm sure our other two guests have more to add on what they hope to see on the social front. It's over to you, Glenda. All right, thanks for that, Don. Now, you've heard Don, you've heard Selena, you've heard Agnew talk about, you know, how um, the cost of inflation, you know, cost of living, jobs, how that's going to affect businesses. But what about us, the man on the street, you and I, right? You know, we've heard the government, um, they've noted this, they've addressed it, and they've had um, the Forward Singapore conversation. So they have... Um, come up with certain priorities, and they said that, you know, this is an assurance that we will be there to take care of you. How much do you think they will step in to actually take care of families, you and I? Walter, why don't I start with you first? Well, I think if you look at families, uh, the fact is there have already been enhancements in recent years to actually help uh, families out. You look at things like, for example, uh, enhancements to the baby bonus scheme and grants, uh, parenthood leave, uh, enhanced access and grants for HDB flats. But I think the fact remains, cost of living is still a huge concern. It's top of mind. I mean, the reason why people don't want to have more children or children is because they're uncertain about the future. And I think we really have to get on top of that, right? We have to make sure that people have the assurance that if they have children, uh, uh, you know, the path ahead will be smooth if they're willing to work hard and take care of them and so on. And I think uh, some of the policies about employment resilience, about helping with the cost of living and so on, these are actually going to be a key concern as well. And one more area might be multi-generational caregiving, where many of our families today have to take care of their children mm -hmm. as well as their elders at the same time. Right, they're caught in this um, yes. sandwich position. You know, Thana Lechmi, the rising cost of inflation, you know, something that the unions and workers, you know, they are worried about as well. You know, how so to what extent here? Yeah, I think there is a great uh, worry among the workers regarding the cost of living. Uh, what is the government going to do? So we have the uh, low wage workers, they have their fair share of worries, but the government transfers may help and I hope to see more transfers mm -hmm. going for them, going to them. And But the other group is the sandwich population. The workers were in the middle, neither here nor there, and uh, they may not be eligible for some of the government transfers of funding and grants, and, and that becomes a problem. So as, uh, as you know that the wage growth has been slowing down over the last two years, and uh, it is not good because uh, it is not expected to cover the rising uh, core inflation, typically. Uh, so that being a problem, I think the best security for any worker is a, a good paying job security. Mm. So we have to ensure that our, our workers have a good paying job. And how do we ensure that? Through training, upskilling, making them relevant to today's jobs to, uh, and also prepare them for tomorrow's job. So to do that, I think uh, we hope to see more support in the area of training, mm. training our workers, well, whether it be older workers, low-wage workers, even PM is pro professional uh, managers and executives. Uh, as you know, that uh, digitalization has, has a whole lot uh, shaped the, the shaped the whole world differently, and that is a w worrisome trend for us if the workers are not keeping up to the changes that's happening uh, in a global context. Right, the march of um, AI. Well, you know, we're going to have to see if you know all that wish list is going to materialize in a budget 2024. We've heard about the kind of support businesses and individuals will be looking out for in this year's budget. It won't be long before we find out about the government's spending plans for the year. Finance Minister Lawrence Wong, we know, has already arrived at Parliament House. So what would be the key priorities for this year? Well, we're counting down to Singapore Budget 2024 and we'll bring you that address live as it happens. Stay with us.
CNA's special coverage of Singapore Budget 2024. We are just a few minutes away from Finance Minister Lawrence Wong's budget speech. You'll watch and hear it live here on CNA and CNA 938. Uh, you would have heard by now that this budget is what the finance minister calls the first instalment of the forward Singapore roadmap. We take you through some of the key moments of the national feedback exercise that kicked off in June of 2022 to refresh the country's social compact. Uh, the aim was to engage Singaporeans of all ages in six key areas. For instance, empower, which is about economy and jobs, equip, and that deals with education and lifelong learning, and care, that looks at health and social support. Uh, in line with the Forward SG exercise, the labor movement conducted its own engagements with workers of all walks of life. The findings were ultimately shared in the report. Ministries also began shortly after. For example, the National Development Ministry launched Our Housing Conversation, tackling housing concerns and finding solutions. Views on strengthening social mobility, they were shared by the Social and Family Development Ministry. About 24 engagements were conducted in total after that. Uh, by November, the Education Ministry had already engaged more than 2,000 Singaporeans, rounding up its first phase in a discussion with 200 youths, parents, as well as educators, to focus on collective action. And just before last year's budget, DPM Wong said that the exercise was at its midway point. 14,000 Singaporeans were engaged across 140 sessions held online as well as in person. And he said at that time that the next phase would go deeper into specific solutions. Months later, a key initiative was Healthier SG a national shift towards preventive care and improving access to health activities as well as programs. Forward SG concluded in October of 2023 with a report highlighting what it calls seven shifts. And these suggestions came from over 200,000 Singaporeans over 16 months. At that time, DPM Wong said that details of some initiatives would be announced in budget 2024 and some of the work well, it has already started. A new government office was launched to get feedback and give support for ground-up initiatives. Uh, the Forward Singapore exercise had highlighted key mindset shifts required from valuing and respecting everyone to building a collective sense of responsibility for all Singaporeans to do their part for the common good. Uh, with the budget expected to include some of these initiatives, Rebecca Mateo highlights possible measures to boost sh social support. An area of focus for this year's budget could be to reduce wage gaps between groups with different educational qualifications, especially because graduates from the Institute of Technical Education currently earn only half of what their university peers do. Moves to help them could include paying for their post-grad diploma or helping them get a head start in buying a home or saving for retirement. Similar moves have been made for seniors to beef up their retirement adequacy as part of the majority Jula package. More details are expected to be announced along with resources to help seniors age well and age gracefully. From tackling rising health care needs to more senior-friendly features across neighbourhoods or housing options that come with integrated care. For young families and aspiring parents, more targeted support too, as fertility rates hit an all-time low of 1.04 in 2022. Recent moves to increase parental leave, offer flexible working arrangements and enhanced cash gifts have been aimed at boosting the nation's birth rate. So we will be expecting DPM Wong to share some good news later. As he previously said, the budget this year falls on the seventh day of Chinese New Year, which is celebrated as the birthday of everyone, and so more goodies and presents to build a better future for all Singaporeans. Well, good news, goodies. Are we looking forward to that? Earlier, we talked about Forward SG and how NTUC had its own conversations. That was NTUC expectations. So how do you think Forward SG will impact the budget um, you know, this year? Thana, we want to start with you. 
Well, I think uh, the every worker co uh, conversation matters. Uh, we have already put forward the recommendations uh, to uh, to the government, and Forward SG actually encompasses several parts of it. For instance, uh, empowering. How do you empower workers? You know, through skill sets, uh, the acquiring skill set, and uh, if you look at caregiving needs. Caregiving needs, whether young family or families that with the older folks uh, with them, uh, they need flexible work arrangement. Mm. And this is one advocacy that we're looking at since 2014, you know. How do you make, uh, you know, family care leave, uh, you know, supported by the government? It's a paid leave. So uh, the other aspect is that retirement adequacy. So if you look at CPF, you know, uh, people uh, who are 55 to 60, uh, I think we can do more in terms of employer-employee contribution to up from 31% to 37%. And so for people who are uh, beyond 60, currently it's 22%, but we can do more to ensure that the CPF contribution can be up further. So that will enable them for their uh, retirement message. Yeah. Right. Um, Walter, how might this budget actually address, you know, issues of, let's look here, diversity, inclusion, as well as, you know, equal opportunities for workers? So I think one of the areas uh, that Forward, as you talked about, is this theme of empowering those in need and, you know, improving social mobility. And I think that's really important because I think we have to give low-resource families the opportunity to participate in our shared prosperity. So we kind of have to shift away from this mindset that we're spending money on, uh, you know, in low-income families, it's a transfer or a handout. It's not. What it's actually about is empowering them, giving them the resources necessary to educate their children well, to actually participate in our, you know, that prosperity to take up good jobs. So I think that's really the key there. Um, I think another area where we talk about inclusion could be this idea of uh, supporting mental well-being, mm -hmm. uh, mental health, because that is actually a major concern of uh, many Singaporeans today. It could also be a reason why some Singaporeans find it difficult, for example, to participate in education, social life, or the workforce. And so we really, again, need to shift gears here to think it's not an expenditure of uh, you know money going to nothing. It's actually supporting fellow Singaporeans so that they can live their best lives and contribute to all of our economy and society as well. Right. Um, you know, Thana Lashmi, NTUC's, um, you know, uh, Every Workers Matter conversation, that was a hashtag that, you know, um, you guys had. The report showed that most mid-career workers, you know, think that training courses can actually help them with skills development, to improve work efficiency, mm -hmm. and at the same time, uh, you know, reduce the risk of being disrupted, right, being yeah. displaced here. Yet, the majority of them from this report I'm seeing here said that the two main barriers to upskilling are the lack of financial resources and the lack of understanding on the training that they need to remain relevant. How can this then be better addressed? So, so there can be a two-pronged approach. Firstly, we have to address the need for training allowance. Mm. For instance, uh, mid-career switches, when they want to switch, you know, uh, can they can they do their second diploma or probably do up uh, some bite-sized training courses that are relevant to industries that have got the jobs available. So we need to ensure that the skill match and the job match, uh, where the gap is narrowed as far as possible. So uh, it takes a lot of effort. So training is is essential, is imperative. The second point is a, it, it is also important to ensure that we have uh, career mentors or career advisors to advise them, to navigate them. Um, for instance, you know, uh, the, uh, WSG has career advisors and then E2I has got mm. career mentors. They've been helping, supporting uh, mid-career switches because sometimes they do not know what is available there, what are the courses that are relevant to ensure them to get a job in that industry that has got promising future? So we have to have two-pronged approach, training, allowance. That means the ability to finance. That's important because many of them get retrenched at that age, mid-career. And uh, the second is to ensure that, uh, that they are navigated correctly, guided so uh, that will add to mental strength. I think uh, Walter mentioned about mental wellness. It is important that uh, whenever a person loses a job, it's anxiety and depression. And we have to ensure that they, they come out of it. 
you know, and how do you do that? So I hope there will be more support for workers as well in the area of mental wellness and uh, mental well-being. Right, talent, right? Yeah. You know, our, our workers are a talent. Singapore's only available natural resource. It's people. What kind of support do you think is necessary to help Singaporeans then stay competitive here? I mean, you, you, you know, NTC is talking about upskilling. Yeah. You know, Walter. Yeah, so, so I think in general, the approach we have to follow is we have to uh, empower people to basically take up good jobs, but it means they need the skills necessary, right, for those jobs. And one area I think we can actually you know, think a bit more hard about is this problem that we have today of how there are wage gaps in the economy mm -hmm. between those who take up uh, non-tertiary levels of education or don't take up degrees, right, and everybody else. And I think this is really about making sure that people who have less than degrees actually get on jobs with, with good career development, good pathways, so that they can eventually end up earning a very good salary and be able to provide for their families and so on. And the problem we have today is that at the entry level of many of these jobs, it's not very attractive. And because of that, we may see too many of these people take up jobs like gig jobs, platform jobs and so on if you don't have a good career pathway. So right. we really have to match that. Yeah. Better. Right. I, well, indeed, we're going to have to see whether, you know, that all, you know, is being addressed. Yes. Well, we know that Finance Minister Lawrence Wong is about to deliver Singapore's 2024 budget statement. Let's take you live to Parliament now. Mr. Speaker. Order. Item 1, Budget Statement, a motion standing in the name of the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance. DPM and Minister for Finance. Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move that Parliament approve the financial Policy of the Government for the financial year 1st April 2024 to 31st March 2025. Sir, the past year has not been easy. The international environment was troubled. The global economy was subdued. Our own economy grew by a modest 1.1%, avoiding a recession. I know that many households are feeling the pressure of higher living costs. Fortunately, we had some unexpected revenue upside from our strong economic rebound in the preceding two years. And this is why the government was able to enhance its assistance measures to relieve the burden on households. For 2024, the outlook is mixed. Growth in the major economies on the whole is expected to remain resilient. But geopolitical risks continue to loom large. Wars are raging in Europe and the Middle East. These conflicts can escalate dangerously, leading to disruptions in global energy markets and supply chains. Fortunately, there are some upsides. Global inflationary pressures are expected to recede further. This may provide some room for the major central banks to adopt more accommodative stances, which can help to ease financial conditions and support demand. The global electronics industry is expected to recover. This will bolster the growth of many regional economies, including our key trading partners. Meanwhile, Asia continues to be a key driver of global growth with a wider spread of opportunities across the region, not just in China, but also in India and many parts of Southeast Asia. Overall, we are cautiously optimistic that 2024 will be a better year. Besides lower inflation, we expect higher GDP growth at 1 to 3%. But there is considerable uncertainty in the outlook and the risks are tilted to the downside. The international environment has darkened dramatically. 
The post-Cold War era that began in the early 90s and fostered three decades of peace and stability is over. We are now in a new era of conflict and confrontation, and there is no turning back. What can we expect in this new world? It will be more violent. We already see a growing zone of impunity involving armed conflict and terrorism that cannot be easily resolved by the global community. It will be more fragmented because the major powers are prioritizing national security over economic interdependence and the traditional modes of cooperation are breaking down. It will be messier and more unpredictable because there will be diminished willingness and capacity to tackle global issues, be it responding to future pandemics or tackling climate change. These are the stark realities before us. For some time to come, Singapore will have to operate in an external environment that will be less stable and favourable to our security and prosperity than the preceding three decades. That is why we embarked on the Forward Singapore exercise to refresh our social compact, to keep our society strong and united, and to set out a roadmap for our way forward in this very troubled world. Through Forward Singapore, we aim to give more assurance to help Singaporeans navigate the uncertainties in today's world strengthen our sense of cohesion and solidarity, and keep our society together. For as one united people, we can overcome all odds. We can turn every challenge into opportunity and every vulnerability into strength. We can build a nation that is vibrant and inclusive, fair and thriving, resilient and united. We have an ambitious agenda to achieve these shared goals. We have major plans to unfold over the coming years. Some are ready to be implemented now. Others will require more time to study or to work out the implementation details. In this budget, we will roll out the first instalment of our Forward Singapore programs. Budget 2024 is therefore about taking concrete steps to build our shared future together. We will tackle immediate challenges for households and businesses, pursue better jobs, better growth and equip our workers for life, create more paths for equality and mobility, provide more assurance for families and seniors, and ultimately forge a stronger and more united nation and I will touch on each of these in turn in the rest of my speech. Sir, we have enjoyed low inflation in Singapore for more than a decade, but inflation rose sharply in 2022 following the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, which led to significant increases in global energy and food prices. Despite the unprecedented surge in prices, we had good economic growth in 2022. So incomes that year rose faster than inflation and Singaporeans were better off in real terms. Unfortunately, this didn't happen last year. Inflation had in fact started to moderate, but economic growth also slowed. As a result, real incomes declined. We had picked up early indicators of this negative trend, and that's why I introduced the cost of living support package in September last year and enhanced the assurance package to over $10 billion. While we expect the situation to improve this year, there are uncertainties in the outlook, as I mentioned just now. So in this budget, I will do more to support households and further enhance the assurance package. First, I will provide an additional $600 in CDC vouchers for all Singaporean households. The first $300 will be disbursed in end June this year. The remaining $300 will be disbursed in January next year. Second, I will provide a cost of living special payment 
of between $200 and $400 in cash. This will be extended to adult Singaporeans with accessible income of up to $100,000 and who do not own more than one property. Third, I will provide additional one-off you-safe rebates to help households cope with increases in their utility bills. In total, eligible HDB households can expect to receive two and a half times the amount of regular you-safe rebates or up to $950 in financial year 2024. This will cover about four months of utility bills for those living in three and four room flats. Fourth, I will provide an additional one-off service and conservancy charges or SNCC rebate for HDB flats. Together with the regular SNCC rebates, eligible HDB households will receive up to four months of such rebates in financial year 2024. Altogether, the additional support under the assurance package will cost $1.9 billion. Uh, we have designed this package so that lower income families get more support. We have also ensured that larger households, particularly those with seniors and children, get more support. Let me give some illustrations. A lower income household of four with two young children will receive about $5,500 in benefits in financial year 2024. This comprises cash, Medisafe top-ups, USAFE and SNCC rebates, and CDC vouchers. A middle-income household of four with two young children will receive about $3,000 in benefits. A middle-income household with six persons, a larger family, including two seniors and two young children, will receive about $8,000 in benefits. Sir, these are concrete ways to help Singaporeans tackle cost of living pressures. Let me assure everyone, we will always have your backs. Beyond the assurance package, I will top up the GSD voucher fund by $6 billion. This delivers on our commitment to permanently defray GSD expenses for lower and middle income households through the GSD voucher scheme. Businesses also need help to manage rising costs. Many companies have seen increases in their wage bills, rental and utilities amongst others. I will therefore introduce an enterprise support package which will provide $1.3 billion in support to companies. First, companies will receive a 50% corporate income tax rebate capped at $40,000 in the year of assessment 2024. Not all companies are profitable and some may not benefit from such a rebate. So I will provide a minimum benefit of $2,000 in cash payouts for companies that employ at least one local employee in 2023. Second, I will enhance the enterprise financing scheme which helps Singapore enterprises with their financing needs. The maximum working capital loan quantum will be permanently raised to $500,000. I will also extend until 31st March 2025 the enhanced maximum trade loan quantum, as well as the government's risk sharing of project loans to support domestic construction projects. Third, I will extend the Skills Future Enterprise credit by a year to 30th, 30th June 2025. The credit provides additional support for eligible employers to cover their out-of-pocket expenses when they embark on workforce and business transformation. With this extension, employers will have another year to claim any unused credit. The measures in this enterprise support package are tilted towards firms that make the effort to restructure and transform. I encourage all firms to make full use of these schemes so that they can thrive and succeed amidst a more challenging operating environment. The enhanced assurance package and the enterprise support package will provide some near-term relief to Singaporean households and firms. These are needed during this period 
when inflation, while moderating, remains on the high side. But they are not permanent solutions. In the longer term, the best way to deal with inflation is to ensure that our firms and workers are more productive and that real incomes continue to rise sustainably. Our key priority, therefore, is to ensure a strong, innovative and vibrant economy. And this is absolutely essential to secure good jobs and better lives for all Singaporeans and on a sustained basis. Since our early days of independence, we have been able to defy the odds and consistently achieve good economic performance. But we cannot afford to be complacent, especially in a more complex and volatile external environment. In past years, uh, some had suggested that Singapore should slow down, don't have to grow so quickly. Indeed, that happened last year. Our economy grew by just about 1%. But if we were to experience similarly slow growth for several years in a row, we will be in trouble. We will have no chance of improving our collective well-being. Singaporeans' living standards will be dented we will not be able to afford the social services we need, and in the end, lower-income workers and families will be hit the hardest. We therefore make no apology for pursuing growth. To be clear, we are not going for growth at all costs. There is a limit to how fast we can grow due to the tighter constraints we face in land, labour and carbon. But by focusing on productivity and innovation, we can push the frontier and grow at an average of about 2 to 3% each year over the next decade. Now, this is an ambitious goal given our stage of economic development, but we must aim high so that Singapore keeps moving forward and our people continue to enjoy more opportunities and a better quality of life. A crucial enabler for growth is our ability to attract high-quality and high-value investments to Singapore, because such projects bring the latest know-how and capabilities and create good jobs for Singaporeans. So far, our investment pipeline has been healthy. Despite a challenging external environment last year, EDB exceeded its targets and brought in investments which are expected to create over 20 thousand new jobs. But the competition for investments is getting tougher. Governments around the world are rolling out vast subsidies to attract investments, especially in strategic industries. For example, in November last year, Japan announced that it would allocate 2 trillion yen, or about 18 billion dollars, to support its semiconductor industry. We cannot afford to engage in a bidding war with the major economies, but neither should we stand still and just do nothing. We will therefore enhance our investment promotion toolkit by introducing a new refundable investment credit. This is a tax credit with a refundable cash feature. It will support high value and substantive economic activities, including the setting up or expansion of manufacturing facilities, new innovation and R&D activities, as well as activities in support of the green transition. Essentially, this new tax credit will help us stay competitive and attract investments from global companies with the right know-how and create good jobs for Singaporeans. To support this and other investment promotion efforts, I will top up the National Productivity Fund by $2 billion. Besides anchoring new investments, we must build on our existing strengths and upgrade the sectors where we have competitive advantages. These advantages did not come about by chance. They are the result of many decades of hard work to restructure and to upgrade our economy. We didn't just keep cost competitive, we also enhanced our capabilities, moved up the value chain, so as to justify the higher premiums for operating out of Singapore. And we are pressing on with these restructuring efforts through the industry transformation maps. 
take semiconductors as one example. Singapore is not the cheapest location worldwide, but we have many things going for us. Our excellent connectivity, our reliability and stable business environment, and also a critical mass of leading companies based here. And they operate across the value chain from design to wafer fabrication to assembly and testing. The companies here do not produce cutting edge three nanometer chips, which you will read about in the media these days. But they have carved out a niche in other types of chips, like specialty chips and NAND flash memory chips. These are critical enablers of automation, 5G, electric vehicles, and they are in high demand. And that's how this little red dot can be a key node in the semiconductor supply chain. We account on our own for more than 10% of the global semiconductor market and 20% of semiconductor equipment in the world. Likewise, in finance, we are a leading center in Asia, supporting businesses from all over the world. And during this period of global uncertainty, we have been able to distinguish ourselves as a stable and trusted financial center. The major financial institutions are keen to do more out of Singapore, and we are seeing a continued inflow of investments, capital, and talent. So whether in advanced manufacturing or high-end services, the strengths we have today are not easily replicated by others. But the global competitive landscape is ever-changing, and other countries, you can be sure, are seeking to overtake us. And so in this budget, I will set aside resources to reinforce our competitive lead. I will top up the Financial Sector Development Fund by $2 billion. This will give MAS more resources to take full advantage of current opportunities and extend our lead in the financial services sector. Not just to do more in the core areas of banking, capital markets, asset management and insurance, but also to build capabilities in new areas like fintech, as well as green and transition finance. I will set aside more funds for R&D, research and development, because this is how we push the frontiers of innovation across the entire economy. In 2020, we launched the Research, Innovation and Enterprise 2025, or RIE 2025 plan, with a commitment of $25 billion. I will invest a further $3 billion in RIE 2025. This will sustain our investments in research, innovation and enterprise at about 1% of GDP. And the additional resources will go towards research and related investments in national priorities like advanced manufacturing, sustainability, the digital economy and healthcare. Our investments in R&D will take some time to translate into concrete outcomes, but we must take a long-term view for these investments help to develop a critical mass of capabilities, ideas, and talent. They enable us to sharpen our competitive edge globally as a knowledge-based and innovation-driven economy. Besides a steady commitment to R&D, we also need to harness the full power of technology across our key sectors. One critical emerging technology is artificial intelligence. AI is not just about chat GPT or large language models. It is a general purpose technology, like electricity, the internal combustion engine, the computer, or the internet. It has the potential to transform a wide range of industries and to enhance productivity across many existing processes, from drug discovery to organizing warehouses or driving vehicles. Singapore is already recognized as a serious player in AI development. We aim to go further, to build new peaks of excellence and crowd in private sector investments. We have set out the plans to do so in the National AI Strategy 2.0. To support this strategy and further catalyze AI activities, I will invest more than $1 billion over the next five years into AI compute, talent, and industry development. Part of the investment will be used to ensure that Singapore can secure access to the advanced chips that are so crucial to AI development and deployment. 
We will also work with leading companies in Singapore and around the world to set up their AI centers of excellence here. We want these centers to spur industry collaboration and innovation and drive greater value creation across the whole economy. In tandem, I will allocate additional resources to catalyze investments in upgrading our nationwide broadband network. With the additional investments, we aim to enable mass market access to broadband speeds of up to 10 gigabits per second in the second half of this decade. This is 10 times faster than the broadband speed in most homes today. This also ensures that our connectivity infrastructure will be able to support technologies like AI and immersive media as they become more pervasive in the future. We will continue to do more to invest in and strengthen our local enterprises. We are helping smaller firms harness technology through pre-approved solutions, many tailored to the needs of specific industries, and this enables the SMEs to plug and play and quickly achieve greater efficiencies and productivity gains. As companies grow, their needs become more complex, especially as they go overseas. We are providing more customized support to help these companies scale up, and we will continue with these efforts. One way for our companies to level up quickly is to partner with the multinational enterprises or the MNEs that are based here. The MNEs set high requirements and standards for firms that wish to partner or supply them. We cannot force MNEs to choose only local suppliers, but we can and we will help Singapore enterprises to meet the high standards and to form win-win partnerships with MNEs. Let me share an example from the aerospace industry. Aerospace parts must meet stringent manufacturing and safety requirements. So aerospace manufacturers like Rolls-Royce are highly selective in who they choose as partners. Zincode, a local company, was supported by the Smart Manufacturing Joint Lab. This is a collaboration between ASTAR, Rolls-Royce, and Singapore Aero Engine Services Private Limited. And the company was supported by this lab to improve its image processing capabilities. As a result, it qualified as one of the approved partners for inspection work at the Rolls-Royce manufacturing facility here in Singapore. Zincode has now successfully captured new opportunities from other companies in the aerospace sector and benefited from an increase in sales. We want to help more companies like Zincode raise their capabilities and win new opportunities. Today we have the Partnerships for Capability Transformation or PACT scheme. This supports collaborations between larger companies and SMEs in the areas of supplier development and co-innovation. I will enhance PACT to support partnerships in more areas, including capability training, internationalization, and corporate venturing. With the enhanced PACT, we aim to help more of our local firms plug into global supply chains, compete in markets abroad, and grow to become industry leaders in their own right. For firms to be competitive, they also need to embrace sustainability. SMEs today sometimes still treat sustainability as an additional imposition and cost. But going green can be a competitive advantage because the MNEs are already looking to reduce their carbon footprint and they expect their suppliers to do the same. In other words, to play in the MNE value chain, our own companies must be sustainability ready. I will therefore extend the enhanced support for green loans under the Enterprise Financing Scheme and expand its, support, its scope to help more of our SMEs adopt green solutions. I will also enhance the energy efficiency grant. This was introduced in 2022 for companies in the food services, food manufacturing and retail sectors. I will extend the grant to more sectors, including manufacturing, construction, maritime and data centers and their users. Beyond pre-approved energy efficient solutions supported under the grant, 
we will provide additional support for companies with more ambitious plans to reduce their emissions. The Minister for Trade and Industry will elaborate on this and other sustainability-related measures at the Committee of Supply. We are taking concrete steps to keep our economy competitive and vibrant and to help our enterprises seize new opportunities. We will do whatever it takes to secure our place as one of the leading economic hubs in the world, known for our innovation, dynamism and deep capabilities, with good jobs and opportunities for our people. Sir, people and talent are critical to our economic dynamism. We are investing heavily in our human capital, including in preschool and education. But learning cannot stop when formal schooling ends, and that's why we launched Skills Future to systematically support Singaporeans in reskilling and upskilling and to equip them through life. The Singapore workforce today ranks highly in terms of skill and technical proficiency. Our workers are able to command a premium in the global marketplace because of their expertise. But with rapid technological advances, expertise is in constant flux. Jobs like data entry clerks and door-to-door -door salesmen have dwindled in numbers. New jobs that did not exist a decade ago, like data scientists and digital marketers, are now in demand. Expertise keeps on changing. In other words, robots and machines will not completely replace humans at work, but they will change the way expertise is defined and how value is created. We therefore have to invest even more in our human capital and help our workers refresh and update their skills and learn how to harness new technologies more effectively. Indeed, this is something that NTUC and the labour movement have consistently championed most recently in the Forward Singapore engagements. We started Skills Future nearly 10 years ago. Since then, government spending on continuing education and training has nearly doubled to $0.9 billion last year. Today, every Singaporean gets a $500 Skills Future credit and all employers get support to train their workers. We have also built up a wide array of training options which individuals enjoy generous subsidies for. We have made good progress over the past decade, but there is still much more to be done. Continuous skills upgrading throughout life is now more important than ever. So we must firmly establish skills future as a key pillar in our social compact. Quality learning and skills training is not just about attending a one or two day course. Workers may need weeks or even months of training to get a proper skills reboot, especially if they are looking to move to a different area of work. Even if they stay in the same industry, they will need a substantial injection of skills from time to time to stay relevant. But we know that taking time off from work to attend training courses over an extended period is not easy especially for those in their 40s and 50s with financial and caregiving obligations. I will therefore introduce a new Skills Future Level Up program to better support our mid-career workers. I will share the broad trust of this package, this program, and the Minister for Education will provide more details at the Committee of Supply. First, I will give all Singaporeans aged 40 and above a top-up in Skills Future credit of $4,000. All Singaporeans aged 40 and above will get the top-up in May this year. For those who are, who are younger, you do not have to worry. Your turn will come. You will get the top-up when you turn 40. <laughs> We have deliberately allowed the existing basic tier of $500 in Skills Future Credit to be used for a wide range of causes, and this was to instill a, ha a habit of lifelong learning. 
the new credit, this $4,000 credit, will be more targeted in scope. We will confine its usage to selected training programs with better employability outcomes. This includes part-time and full-time diploma, post-diploma, undergraduate programs, as well as courses for the progressive wage model sectors. And that's because we want participants taking up these programs to be assured of better employment outcomes after they have completed their training. Second, to provide more reskilling options, I will provide subsidies to all Singaporeans aged 40 and above to pursue another full-time diploma at our polytechnics, ITE and arts institutions from academic year 2025 onwards. In other words, we will give every Singaporean another bite of the education subsidy. Even after you have graduated from an institution of higher learning as a younger person, you can come back again after you turn 40 to do a full-time diploma and it will be at subsidised rates. Third, I will provide a monthly training allowance to Singaporeans aged 40 and above who enrol in selected full-time courses. This training allowance will be equivalent to 50% of one's average income over the last available 12-month period and will be capped at $3,000 per month. Every individual can receive up to 24 months of such a training allowance throughout their lifetime. And this will support the full duration of a Skills Future Career Transition Program and more than half the duration of most qualifications issued by our institutes of higher learning. What do these changes mean for our workers? Take the example of Mr. Kelvin Lee, 40 years old now. He graduated from Singapore Polytechnic with a diploma in Electronic Computer and Communication Engineering. He works today as a project director at Kuhn Engineering, which is a mechanical and electrical service provider. With the Skills Future Level Up program, he will enjoy a $4,000 top-up in Skills Future credit. He can use the credit to pursue a second diploma. This diploma will be offered at subsidized fees, and the credit will cover more than half of the expense of the subsidies. Should he intend to do this full-time, he can receive the monthly training allowance of up to 50% of his previous pay for two years. Sir, we are making a significant enhancement to our skills future ecosystem, but we will reap the full benefits only if all of us, government employers, workers and unions, work lean forward to truly deepen this culture of lifelong learning and skills mastery. This must be our shared commitment to one another, to help our fellow Singaporeans develop to their fullest potential and to have productive and meaningful careers. Uh, there is one other move we will make under Skills Future. Uh, we know that technological changes will bring about more churn in the economy. Even when the economy as a whole is doing well, some businesses or even some industries may be suffering. In fact, it is not possible to have an economy that is dynamic and growing without failures and losses. In some sectors, firms will have to let go of people, while in other sectors, new and better jobs will be created. We have to accept this reality, but it doesn't mean we should be indifferent to the suffering caused when firms lay off their workers. Losing a job is a major setback for workers and their families. Those who become involuntarily unemployed naturally feel the pressure to rush into the first available job they find. <clears throat> but the new job may not always be a good fit. Ideally, they should consider ways to upgrade their skills and to find a job that fits their aptitude and talent. But displaced workers may not have the time to train or search for new jobs, especially when they are already straining to make ends meet. Therefore, we will do more to support this group of workers. In particular, we will introduce a temporary financial support scheme for the involuntarily unemployed while they undergo training or look for better fitting jobs. We have to design this scheme carefully, including the quantum of support 
and the conditionalities that come with the support. This is to avoid the pitfalls that other countries experienced when they introduced unemployment benefits. We are working out the parameters for the scheme and we will provide more details later this year. Ours must always be an op economy that provides opportunities for all, an economy that benefits the many rather than the few. This is why we are making significant enhancements to Skills Future and supporting job seekers while they search for their next opportunity. We believe that every worker matters and every citizen counts. We will equip every Singaporean to benefit from the fruits of our economic growth. In many developed countries, rising inequality and slowing mobility have fractured cohesion and deeply divided their peoples. And this can create similar pressures here. Indeed, we embarked on the Forward Singapore exercise because we do not want to succumb to the kind of harsh inequality we see in so many parts of the world. By creating more paths towards equality and mobility, we also put ourselves in a better position for continued growth. In other words, a strong economy and a strong society reinforce each other. But tackling inequality is often easier said than done. Ideas on how to do so are frequently replete with unintended consequences. Simple handouts and blunt measures do not solve poverty. This is why Singapore has continually paved our own way since the beginning. We carefully study the experiences of others, we take note of where they have succeeded and failed, and we introduce significant innovations that work for us, our ethos, our society. This is the Singapore way. Over the last decade, we have made progress in uplifting lower wage workers and reducing disparities in wages. Our income inequality, as measured by the Gini coefficient, has declined to its lowest level over two decades. Workfare and progressive wages are our two key, our, our key strategies to uplift our lower wage workers. These strategies are working. I will make several adjustments to ensure they continue to deliver results. First, I will enhance the Workfare Income Supplement Scheme from next year. I will raise the qualifying income cap from $2,500 to $3,000. This ensures that we continue to cover lower wage workers even as their wages grow. I will also raise workfare payouts. Lower wage senior workers will qualify for a maximum annual payout of $4,900 up from $4,200 today. Second, I will raise the local qualifying salary or the LQS. All local employees at companies that hire foreign workers must be paid the LQS. The LQS for full-time workers will be raised from $1,400 to $1,600 from this year. The minimum hourly rate will be increased from 9 to 10.50 per hour. This increase ensures we keep pace with wage growth. Third, I will provide more support for employers who raise the wages of their lower wage workers. In 2022, I introduced the Progressive Wage Credit Scheme, or the PWCS, where the government co-funds the wage increase of lower wage workers with employers. I know employers are concerned about rising business costs in today's economy, so the government will do its part to help. I will raise the core funding levels for this year from a maximum of 30% to a maximum of 50%. I will also raise the PWCS wage ceiling from $2,500 to $3,000 in 2025 in tandem with the increase in the qualifying income cap for workfare. And to provide for these enhancements, I will top up the PWCS fund by $1 billion. Besides uplifting lower wage workers, we also want to improve wages across different professions. There will always be differences in wages in any society, but too large a gap 
creates unhealthy levels of anxiety and stress. Parents and children may get caught up in an education arms race, or may feel pressured to prioritize careers only in a few traditional fields instead of focusing on their individual strengths and talents. In fact, the vast majority of Singaporeans in the Forward Singapore engagements welcome broader definitions of success. We want more diverse pathways so that every individual can strive to be the best possible version of themselves. Uh, this also means we must accord greater value to those who are skilled in technical hands-on abilities, as well as those with the social and empathetic traits to excel in service jobs. In particular, the wages and career prospects of our ITE graduates should not be too far below their polytechnic and university-going peers. I recently met some ITE graduates. I was inspired by their personal stories and their enthusiasm to deepen the skills they have acquired at ITE. One of them, Matthew Francis Tanaraju, graduated from ITE in 2021 with a higher NITEC in mechatronics. He is now pursuing a diploma in mechatronics at Tamasic Polytechnic and honing his skills in automation and robotics. These experiences have equipped him with confidence to pursue his aspirations in engineering, and he will be representing Singapore at the World Skills Competition later this year in France, and we wish him the very best. We want to encourage and support more young ITE graduates in their upskilling efforts so they can excel in a profession they have trained in and get themselves on a better career and wage trajectory. I will therefore provide more support for ITE graduates aged 30 and below through a new ITE Progression Award. There are two parts to the award. First, I will provide a $5,000 top-up to the post-secondary education accounts of ITE graduates when they enroll in the diploma program. This will help to offset the cost of obtaining a diploma. Second, when these students attain their diplomas, I will provide a further $10,000 top-up to their CPF ordinary accounts. This will give them a head start in purchasing a home or saving for retirement. Sir, this new award is a significant investment in our ITE graduates. It represents our continuing commitment to uplift them and to better equip them in their journey of lifelong learning. Uh, besides tackling inequality, we must also uphold social, social mobility. And up to now, Singapore has fared better than other advanced economies. But we must continue to pay special attention to children from less well-off families to ensure they have access to full and fair opportunities early in life. Many of these families are already taking steps to build better lives for themselves, but they may find it hard to sustain progress. We know they often face very complex challenges, including marital stress, existing debts, or even motivation or self-confidence issues. Under the enhanced Comlink, or Comlink Plus, we are providing more customized support for these families. We are getting family coaches and volunteer befrienders to work directly with these families. They will jointly develop action plans to improve their life circumstances, and the coaches will provide additional support to the families so as to encourage and motivate them towards their goals. The additional support will be rolled out in the form of Comlink Plus progress packages. And this is yet another major innovation in our social policy landscape. For example, adults in the family can each receive payouts of up to $600 every quarter through a combination of cash and CPF if they secure a job and stay employed. Those who make voluntary contributions to their CPF will receive matching grants from the government to grow their savings faster. And this, combined with existing schemes like the Fresh Start Housing Scheme, will help these families buy their own homes. We will also partner with corporates and community groups to implement the Comlink Plus progress packages. 
The donors can provide additional financial support to these families and contribute in other ways like befriending and mentoring to help them get back on their feet again. So in this budget, we are taking further steps to ensure that all Singaporeans have opportunities to take on work they find meaningful and fulfilling, build on their talents, give their best and be rewarded fairly for it. This is how we keep the Singapore dream alive and well for all our people. The government will do our part, but I want to emphasise that it is not just about the government doing more. We also need our employers, community groups, as well as families and individuals themselves to step up. Together, we can and we will build a fairer, a more equal and a more inclusive Singapore. Next, let me touch on our plans to build a Singapore made for families, an endearing home for all of us to sink roots, grow up and grow old in. Families are the bedrock of our society and we will support their needs at every stage of life. Let me start with support for our children to give them a strong foundation in life. We will continue to take steps to improve preschool affordability. At government-supported preschools, we extend generous subsidies so that out-of-pocket expenses are kept affordable. We will lower the fees further so that full-day preschool expenses for dual-income families will be comparable to those of primary school and after-school student care. We will do so in two stages. I will reduce monthly childcare fee caps in government-supported preschools in 2025 to $640 for anchor operators and $680 for partner operators. This is before the childcare subsidies which all families benefit from. I will make another move to reduce fee caps in 2026 and the details will be announced later. I will also enhance existing preschool subsidies for lower income families. Currently, more subsidies are given to children with working mothers. I will extend these higher subsidies to all children from lower income families, including those with non-working mothers. This will benefit up to 17,000 children. In schools, we will do more to help our children develop the competencies and values they need to thrive in a more unpredictable future. MOE is placing more emphasis on competencies like adaptive and inventive thinking, communication skills, and civic literacy. We want to encourage and recognize students who demonstrate such competencies, including by enhancing the EduSafe awards. I will therefore top up the EduSafe Endowment Fund by $2 billion to support these and other education initiatives. For young couples who are getting ready to settle down and form their own families, Timely access to affordable housing is critical. We are helping such first-timer families by ramping up BTO supply and giving them greater priority. We are also making flats in choicer locations more affordable and in a way that's fair and inclusive through the prime, plus and standard framework. And this will be implemented later this year for new BTO projects. Some couples have already booked their BTO flats, but they may like to have a place to stay temporarily while they wait for the completion of their flats. And this is especially the case for those with young children. Currently, HDB offers subsidized rental housing under the Parenthood Provisional Housing Scheme, or the PPHS. HDB receives many such applications for the scheme, and it is ramping up supply to meet the demand. But in the interim, we do want to do more to support such young families with urgent housing needs. I will therefore provide a PPHS open market voucher for one year to support eligible families who rent a HDB flat in the open market. In this budget, I will also do more for families of persons with special needs or disabilities. We know that families of children with special needs face greater cost pressures due to higher fees at education and care services. 
Every student at a special education or SPED school already benefits from more subsidies than a primary school student in a mainstream school. But the fees at most SPED schools remain higher than those of mainstream schools due to the higher underlying cost. We are studying further moves to alleviate the cost pressures on these families. As a first step, I will reduce the maximum monthly fees at SPED schools to $90 down from $150 today. I will also lower the fee caps at all special student care centres to reduce the out-of-pocket expenses for families. For adults with disabilities, I will provide more support for their employment and integration into the community. I will expand spaces in sheltered workshops and day activity centres where they can undergo skills training and launch more enabling services hub to provide community support to persons with disabilities and their caregivers. The respective ministers will share more on each of these moves at the Committee of Supply. I will do more to support the retirement needs of our seniors. And let me start with some adjustments to the CPF system. First, in line with the recommendations of the tripartite group on older workers, we will continue with this next step of planned CPF contribution rate increases for senior workers. I will increase the CPF contribution rates for those aged 55 to 65 by a further 1.5 percentage points in 2025. I will also provide the CPF transition offset to employers for another year to cover half of the increase in employer contributions for 2025. This will help to cushion the impact on business cost. Second, I will raise the enhanced retirement sum. The ERS is the maximum amount that members can put into their CPF retirement accounts to receive CPF payouts. I will increase the ERS from three times the basic retirement sum to four times from 2025. This means the ERS next year will be $426,000. And this will allow more members aged 55 and above to fully commit their accumulated CPF savings to receive higher payouts should they wish to do so. Third, we will take steps to rationalize the CPF system. Today, members aged 55 and above have a special account and a retirement account. From next year, we will close the CSA, the special account, for those aged 55 and above. The SA savings will be transferred to the RA or the retirement account up to the full retirement sum where they will continue to earn the long-term interest rate. The remaining SA savings will be transferred to the ordinary account. Of course, members can voluntarily transfer these OA savings to the RA at any time, up to the revised ERS to earn higher interest and to receive higher retirement payouts. I will also enhance the retirement support schemes for seniors who need more help. The Silver Support Scheme provides quarterly payments to seniors who had low incomes during their working years and have less family support. I will raise the qualifying per capita household income threshold for Silver Support from $1,800 to $2,300 and increase the quarterly payments by 20% to keep pace with inflation. <coughs> the matched retirement Saving Scheme, or the MRSS, helps Singaporeans aged 55 to 75 with less CPF savings to save more by providing dollar-for-dollar -dollar matching for cash top-ups to their CPF accounts. I will make several adjustments to the scheme. I will extend the MRSS to those above the age of 70. This will enable more Singaporeans to meet their retirement needs with the help from their families, with employers and the community. I will increase the annual matching cap from $600 to $2,000 and set a lifetime ma matching cap of $20,000. Currently, we provide a tax relief to encourage Singaporeans to top up the CPF. But the matching grant is already a significant benefit extended by the government. So we will remove the tax relief for the cash top-ups that attract the matching grant. 
These changes to the Silver Support Scheme and the MRSS will take effect from 2025. Young seniors who are currently in their 50s and early 60s will get an additional boost for their retirement through the Majula package. This was announced by Prime Minister Lee at last year's National Day rally. While the package is geared towards supporting young seniors, Pioneer and Madeka generation seniors will benefit too. In fact, all Singaporeans born in 1973 or earlier will receive at least one component of the Majula package. Let me explain. First, I will provide an earn and save bonus to help seniors earning up to $6,000 per month accumulate more retirement savings. They will receive a yearly bonus of up to $1,000 for as long as they work, with more going to those who earn lower incomes. Second, I will provide a one-time retirement savings bonus of between $1,000 and $1,500 to seniors with retirement savings below the basic retirement sum. Both these bonuses will be for seniors who live in a property with annual value of $25,000 or less and own no more than one property. Third, I will provide a one-time Medisafe bonus to all seniors born in 1973 or earlier. Young seniors with less means will be given the higher tier of $1,500 and all other seniors will receive $750. The Minister for Manpower will share more details at the COS. In all, the Majula package will benefit about 1.6 million Singaporeans at a total lifetime cost of $8.2 billion. To honour this commitment without burdening future generations, I will set aside $7.5 billion in a new fund, the Majula Package Fund, and this will be sufficient to cover the lifetime cost of the package after accounting for in investment income of the fund. Another significant undertaking is healthcare. Over the years, we have invested heavily to ensure healthcare remains affordable and accessible for all. MOH's annual budget has tripled within a decade, and we have put the additional spending to good use. We are devoting more resources to growing areas of growing importance like preventive health, support for our seniors, and mental health and well-being, as recently affirmed by this House. We also continue to enjoy improvements in health outcomes with Singaporeans living longer and healthier lives. But with a rapidly aging population, the fiscal pressures of healthcare will only grow. As a responsible government, we have to plan ahead and set aside sufficient resources to keep healthcare affordable for all. The GSD increase was meant for this purpose. Essentially, we are pre-funding the rising healthcare expenditure by increasing GSD now, instead of waiting to do so in the future. Because if we wait, we will end up imposing a heavier burden on our future selves and our children. Of course, individuals have a part to play too. And that's why we launched Healthier SG, to empower all Singaporeans to take charge of their own health. While it is still early days, the momentum is very encouraging. More than 700,000 Singapore residents have enrolled in Healthier SG. One of them is Madam Rubia, who turned 69 this year. Uh, she credits her Healthier SG consultation for timely advice on how best to manage her health. Today, she is monitoring her blood pressure daily, cutting down on ice cream and koropo in her diet, and staying active through exercise classes and nature walks. And she has also helped to spread the word by volunteering at a Healthier SG Roadshow. So I urge all seniors to follow in the footsteps of Madam Rubia. Heed your doctor's advice, participate in programs that help you stay healthy, and even pass it on by contributing as a senior volunteer. 
Even with healthier lifestyles, all of us will still need some form of medical care as we get older, and especially nearer to the end of life. We must expect healthcare costs, including medical insurance premiums, to rise even after generous government subsidies. We want to ensure that all Singaporeans, including the self-employed and those who are not working, are able to build up their medical savings in anticipation of these rising costs. I will therefore provide all adult Singaporeans aged 21 to 50 a one-time Medisave bonus of up to $300. This will benefit about 1.4 million Singaporeans and help them to cover their smaller medical bills and insurance premiums. And coupled with the Majula package for older cohorts, we will collectively provide a MediSafe bonus for about 3 million Singaporeans this year. To provide more support for healthcare costs, I will also update the per capita household income thresholds for our healthcare and associated social support subsidy schemes. Such schemes include the MediShield Life Premium Subsidies, the Community Health Assist Scheme or CHAS subsidies for primary care, and subsidies for outpatient and inpatient treatments at our public hospitals. The changes to the per capita household income thresholds will mean additional government spending in healthcare and other related areas of around $300 million per year more than one million Singaporeans can expect to benefit from higher subsidies. This will provide greater assurance for healthcare costs, which will also reduce the financial pressures on caregivers. Uh, preventive care is especially important for seniors. Loneliness can do great harm to a senior. They need to stay active and socially connected. This is why we have HWELL SG. It's a new national program to support seniors to age actively, stay socially connected, and be cared for within their own communities. I will set aside $3.5 billion for HWELL SG initiatives over the next decade, and this includes several components. First, an expanded network of active aging centres, so that all seniors can look forward to a wider range of programmes at these centres, from physical exercises to volunteering opportunities. Second, for seniors with care needs, we will develop more assisted living options, such as the community care apartments, and better home care arrangements to empower them to age confidently in their homes and community. Third, several updates to our residential estates to enable seniors to live more independently and safely in the community. And this will cover amenities like therapeutic gardens and barrier-free ramps and senior-friendly home fittings like wider toilet entrances and shower seats. Fourth, improvements to our commuter infrastructure for seniors' mobility and safety. This means more sheltered linkways, bus stops with senior-friendly features, as well as safer and more pedestrian-friendly roads. Sir, when you combine all of these efforts, the suite of investments we are making in education, housing, retirement and healthcare, they speak to our steadfast commitment to address the needs of our families and seniors through every stage of life. Through these investments, we will provide more assurance to all Singaporeans to set minds at ease, improve lives and well-being and ensure Singapore remains home truly for all of us. Alongside our investments to strengthen our economy and society, we will also make the investments needed to forge a stronger and more united nation. We will safeguard what makes Singapore special and resilient, our commitment to take care of and defend one another, sustain the trust we have in each other and our institutions, and build our strong sense of national pride and identity. Since independence, we have invested steadily to safeguard our peace and security. Over the last two decades, we have allocated around 3 to 4 percent of our GDP annually to MINDEF's budget. At the same time, over the past decade, our spending on domestic security has doubled 
to more than $8 billion, or about 1.3% of our GDP. We will continue to build and maintain a strong and effective SAF and home team. We will invest in them, upgrade their capabilities year by year to protect ourselves from potential aggressors and security threats. And the backbone of our defence and security remains national service. We owe a huge debt to our national servicemen who have served faithfully and made immeasurable sacrifices for our peace and security. I will therefore provide $200 in the form of Life SG credits to all past and present national servicemen, including those enlisting this year. It is a small gesture, but when you add it all up, it will cost us $240 million and benefit 1.2 million, million national servicemen. I hope this will go some way in expressing our appreciation and gratitude to our national servicemen as well as their families for all that they have done and will continue to do for our country. In today's world, defence and security apply not just in the physical environment but also in the digital domain. Scams, ransomware, data breaches, denial of service and other cyber threats have become increasing, increasingly commonplace. <coughs> the development and adoption of new technologies like AI and quantum computing also change the threat landscape. Cyber attacks will increase in speed, scale and sophistication. We have taken steps to strengthen our cyber defence. We established the Digital and Intelligence Service in the SAF. We will establish a new National Cyber Security Command Centre at the Pongol Digital District to better coordinate cyber defence operations, improve collaboration with industry and academia, and spur innovation in cyber security. This will improve our capabilities to monitor, detect and coordinate our defences against cyber threats. Besides the conventional areas of security, we need to address an emerging security challenge, and that is energy, but more specifically, the transition to cleaner energy. In the near to medium term, natural gas, which generates almost all our electricity, will remain critical. Our natural gas supplies come through pipelines from Malaysia and Indonesia and in the form of liquefied natural gas or LNG from a range of sources. We are now planning to build a second LNG terminal to meet our growing electricity needs. Natural gas is the cleanest of all fossil fuels, but we will not be able to achieve net zero if we continue to rely solely on natural gas. Unfortunately, we do not have many options for clean energy. We have no tidal power, no wind power, and not enough land for mass deployment of solar. So what do we do? One way is to import low-carbon electricity, and we are making progress on this front. But there is a limit to importing electricity without compromising security. So we will need other options to decarbonize the rest of our energy supply. And that's why we are actively exploring other options. Hydrogen has the potential as a clean fuel. For now, it is still technologically nascent, costly and risky. Nevertheless, we have set out a national hydrogen strategy to take purposeful steps forward. We will start by testing and deploying ammonia which is a hydrogen carrier, for power generation and bunkering on Jurong Island. We are also exploring other energy sources. We are actively studying the possibilities for geothermal power. After all, we do have a hot spring in Sambawang. <laughs> but we will need very deep drilling to assess the potential, and it really remains to be seen if this will be viable. <clears throat> Further out in the future, we do not rule out nuclear power. Nuclear technologies are advancing rapidly with smaller, safer and more fuel-efficient designs. We will build up our capabilities so that we can critically assess 
the evolving technologies in this space and decide on the feasibility of nuclear deployment one day in the future. And there is considerable uncertainty as to how all these energy pathways will work out. What is clear, however, is that significant effort and costs will be needed to transit from a system powered almost entirely by natural gas today to one powered largely by clean energy. We say this is an energy transition. Transition sounds like a rather innocuous word, but the scale of this so-called transition is massive and we will need to get it done over the next two decades or so, which is not a lot of time when you think about the enormity of the task. For example, to import low carbon electricity, we will need to invest in submarine cables and upgrade our existing power grid. Or if we decide to scale up the use of hydrogen, we will need to put in place new infrastructure for generation, storage and delivery. All of these investments are costly. They cannot be done by the private sector alone and will likely need some catalytic funding from the government. I will therefore set up a future energy fund with an initial injection of $5 billion. This will give us the confidence to invest in good time, put us in a better position to move quickly on critical infrastructure and enhance our security in clean energy. The resilience of our nation, of course, is not just measured by what we spend or by our infrastructure or hardware. Rather, our true resilience lies within. In the strong bonds Singaporeans have forged amongst ourselves and in our collective willingness to take care of one another. Every Singaporean man, woman and child knows that he or she belongs to this island nation. Everyone has a place in our society. Each has a role to play in our unfolding Singapore story. That is the essence of total defence, which we commemorated for the 40th time yesterday. Uh, we nurture these bonds between Singaporeans by strengthening our culture of giving. There are many who have done well in Singapore and they want to give back, but they may not know how or where to start. We will do more to help these donors better appreciate the needs of our society and advise them on how to more effectively direct their resources, financial or non-financial, to support lower-income families. This effort will be led by the Community Foundation of Singapore in partnership with MSF and the Community Chest. In the same spirit, we want to encourage charities to work together to uplift each other and better meet the needs of their beneficiaries. I will do so by extending the Charities Capability Fund Collaboration Grant for three years, still end financial year 2026. This will support collaborative projects amongst charities to enhance their governance, efficiency and capabilities. Doing good also extends beyond our shores. Many Singaporeans readily step forward to support those affected by humanitarian crises overseas. We saw this in the relief efforts following the devastating earthquake in Turkey and Syria last year, and also in the generous donations in response to the human tragedy arising from the Israel-Hamas conflict. To encourage Singaporeans to support those in need overseas, I will introduce an overseas humanitarian assistance tax deduction scheme. This will provide 100% tax deductions for cash donations made towards overseas emergency humanitarian assistance causes through designated charities. This will run for four years as a pilot scheme. A stronger culture of giving will bind us closer together and make us a more caring and gracious society. Another way to strengthen our solidarity is through the common experiences we all partake in and the arts and sports provide us with the platforms to do so. Let me start with the arts. The, the arts help to express our unique Singaporean culture, strengthen our shared bonds, and make Singapore a distinctive home. The National Arts Council has refreshed the Our SG Arts Plan to drive transformation efforts in the arts sector. We will support this plan by investing $100 million over the next four years. As part of this plan, 
We aim to make the arts more accessible to all Singaporeans. We will unlock more opportunities and touch points for our artists to infuse the arts everywhere, in our city and our communities. The additional investments will also strengthen the foundation for a more vibrant arts industry. NAC will support arts groups to develop and showcase their diverse arts offerings as well as to strengthen our talent pool. Self-employed artists will also benefit from more development opportunities to broaden and deepen their skills. Apart from the arts, there are few endeavours that can rally the country and ignite the Singapore spirit like sports. From the grassroots to the global stage, from community participation to high performance, sports bring Singaporeans from all walks of life together. At a grassroots level, we will enable more Singaporeans to participate in sports by continuing to support the Sports Facilities Master Plan. With this, Singaporeans can look forward to new and rejuvenated sports centres in Tuapayo, Pongol and Clementi, as well as more sports and recreational facilities in our neighbourhoods. Many Singaporeans want to support our national athletes and we will provide them with more platforms to do so. We will anchor more major sports events in Singapore so that our athletes can compete in top-tier competitions against the world's best on home ground. And this will also allow more Singaporeans to cheer for Team Singapore. We now have the One Team Singapore Fund, which provides dollar-for-dollar -dollar matching for donations towards Team Singapore athletes. I will provide a $20 million top-up for the One Team Singapore Fund and expand it till end financial year 2027. In addition, I will broaden the scope of donations eligible for matching to cover athletes in emerging sports like pickleball, chookball, and powerlifting. I will also include Sport Cares, which provides opportunities for vulnerable children and youth, persons with disabilities and seniors to participate in sporting programs. The Minister for Culture, Community and Youth will share more about our arts and sports initiatives at the COS. Sir, everywhere in the world, we see societies becoming increasingly divided and nations becoming more and more fragile. Economic growth or social transfers alone cannot guarantee that we succeed. This budget therefore invests in our national resilience, from ensuring the effectiveness of our military and domestic security, to safeguarding our energy security and building a stronger national identity. These will shield us from external threats and the forces that threaten to pull us apart. Only then can we be confident that Singapore will endure. Our ability to invest in our economy, our society and our resilience has to be anchored on a strong fiscal position. Fiscal responsibility has always been a key part of the Singapore DNA. We spend our resources wisely and we take great care to provide for our children and our grandchildren. This is why I made major revenue moves in the last two budgets. These moves have put us on a stronger fiscal footing for the next decade, while ensuring that our overall system of public finances remains fair and progressive. This year, in light of concerns over cost of living, I will provide a personal income tax rebate of 50% for the year of assessment 2024. This will be capped at $200 so that the benefits go mostly to our middle income workers. The rebate will cost the government $350 million. Currently, taxpayers may claim a range of dependent related benefits, uh, reliefs, if their dependents have an annual income of $4,000 or less. We have received feedback from members of public, tax practitioners, as well as Labour MPs to consider increasing the dependent income threshold in view of rising cost of living and wage levels. So with effect from the year of assessment 2025, I will increase 
the annual income threshold for dependent-related reliefs from $4,000 to $8,000. In Budget 2022, I announced a two-step increase in property tax rates for residential properties. This was meant as a wealth tax targeted at all investment properties as well as the higher-end segment of owner-occupied properties. Prior to, that, budget, prior to that budget announcement, market rents had been rel relatively flat for the preceding five years. But from 2022 onwards, market rents increased significantly due to the combination of strong de demand and COVID-related supply constraints. As a result, the annual values or the AVs also increased sharply. We had originally expected the property tax changes to impact mainly the top 7% of owner-occupied residential properties. Uh, the AV increases resulted in the proportion of affected owner-occupied properties nearly doubling to 13%. In light of these market trends, I will raise all the AV bands of the owner-occupier residential property tax rates with effect from 1st January 2025. Currently, property tax is charged on the bands of AV from $8,000 to over $100,000. I will raise the lower threshold from $8,000 to $12,000 and the highest band from over $100,000 to over $100,000 and $40,000, and corresponding adjustments will be made to the bands in between. This will still uphold the intent of the property tax changes and ensure that those residing in higher value properties continue to pay their fair share of taxes. And the government had provided a rebate to cushion the impact of the property tax changes this year. We will continue to closely monitor the property market and will provide another rebate in 2025 if needed. We recognize that there are retirees living in higher-end residential homes who face cash flow issues when paying their property tax bills. To help them, IRS will offer a 24-month installment plan without any interest. They can apply for this via IRS's website or contact IRS for more details. Next, I will adjust the additional buyer's stamp duty, or the ABSD, for the purchase of residential properties. Today, married couples with an existing residential property can enjoy an ABSD refund on their replacement private property under the ABSD concession for Singaporean married couples. To better support seniors who wish to right-size, I will extend the concession to single Singapore citizens aged 55 and above. In other words, these seniors will be able to claim a refund of ABSD paid on their replacement private property if they sell their first property within six months after purchasing a lower value replacement private property. And this extension will take effect from today. I will also introduce some flexibility to the ABSD regime for housing developers. Housing developers are now granted an ABSD remission provided they sell all the units in their development within a prescribed sale timeline. But despite their best efforts, the developers sometimes face difficulties in meeting this timeline requirement. They are then subject to a full clawback of the ABSD. I will lower the ABSD clawback rate should developers sell at least 90% of each development within the prescribed sale timeline. This ensures that housing supply continues to be released promptly while providing some flexibility to the developers. The details of this change will be released in a statement later today. Next, corporate income tax. I will make significant adjustments to our tax system to take into consideration the International Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, or BEPS 2.0 initiative. To recap, BEPS comprises two pillars. Pillar 1 aims to reallocate taxing rights on profits to market jurisdictions. When implemented, it will result in revenue losses for Singapore. 
Pillar 1 has been delayed for now and the implementation date remains unclear. Pillar 2 will introduce a global minimum effective tax rate of 15% for large M&E groups. Last budget, I announced our intention to implement Pillar 2 from 2025 and that we would monitor and adjust the timeline if needed. Since then, several jurisdictions have moved. The EU, the UK, Switzerland, Japan and Korea are implementing Pillar 2 rules from 2024. Others like Hong Kong and Malaysia have announced their plans to do so from 2025. We will therefore move ahead with two components of Pillar 2 as planned. The first is the Income Inclusion Rule, or IIR. A jurisdiction that introduces this will subject the overseas profits of M&E groups parented in that jurisdiction to a minimum effective tax rate of 15%. So we will implement the IIR. In other words, M&E groups that are parented in Singapore will have to pay a minimum effective tax rate of 15% on their group's overseas profits, regardless of where they operate. The second component is the domestic top-up tax, or the DTT. This applies to the Singapore profits of M&E groups operating here. Without this tax, these M&E groups would have had to pay their parent jurisdictions the effective tax rate of 15% on their Singapore profits. Therefore, it is in our interest to implement the DTT so that we collect the tax rather than have it go somewhere else. The IIR and the DTT will take effect for businesses' financial years starting on or after 1st January 2025 and will apply to large M&E groups with global revenue of at least 750 million euros annually. There is another component of Pillar 2, the undertaxed profits rule. This is effectively a backstop as it will allow Singapore to collect a share of the top-up tax on any M&E with operations here if any portion of its income overseas has not been subject to the minimum tax. We will co consider this at a later stage. Because with the DTT and the IIR, we are already making major changes to our corporate tax regime. So we will focus on implementing these changes first and ensure a smooth rollout for the affected companies. In the short term, the implementation of Pillar 2 will provide additional revenues. But it is uncertain how much this will be or how long it will last. We may even see a reduction in our tax base should MNEs shift some of the activities to other jurisdictions in response to the new business environment. In any case, whatever additional revenues we obtain from Pillar 2 will need to be reinvested for Singapore to stay competitive in a post bats world. MNEs are now re-evaluating their plans and strategies. Other governments are also enhancing and refreshing their investment promotion toolkits. And that's why we are introducing the refundable investment credit which I mentioned earlier. We will also have to spend more to support new investments, research and innovation activities and sustain our economic competitiveness. Overall, given the significant spending required to stay competitive at this point, I do not expect the new moves to generate net revenue gains for Singapore on a sustained basis. I will also make some further tax adjustments to ensure our tax system remains fair and competitive, and details of the tax changes are in the annex to the budget. Sir, last year, the Ministry of Finance released a set of projections of our medium-term fiscal outlook. These showed that government spending has been rising steadily over the years. Our spending in the late 2000s was around 15% of GDP. And over the span of 10 years, it has grown by 3 percentage points of GDP to around 18% of GDP. We expect spending to continue rising in this decade. Healthcare is one key driver for the increase, but there are additional spending needs fueling the increase. We will have to spend more for the major moves to decarbonize our economy, as I explained earlier. As part of Forward Singapore, we are making significant policy shifts to strengthen our social safety nets and provide more assurance to Singaporeans. I've just introduced some of these measures in this year's budget. We will spend around $5 billion on Forward Singapore policy moves in 
financial year 2024 and close to $40 billion in total by the end of this decade. In our projections, MOF had assessed that government spending will increase to around 20% of GDP by 2030. For now, that remains our assessment. Assuming we stay within this range of spending increase, we should have sufficient revenues to maintain a balanced budget over the coming years. But the medium-term fiscal position is tight because there are so many pressures for us to spend more, be it on healthcare, social needs, or the energy transition, and these are all big-ticket items. We will have to manage these expenditures carefully, or we will end up with a significant funding gap. We can already see this happening in many other advanced economies where public finances are on an unsustainable path and fiscal systems are at risk of breaking. We must never allow this to happen in Singapore. Instead, let us uphold the ethos of fiscal discipline and responsibility that has served us well and ensure that our fiscal position always remains balanced, sound and sustainable. Uh, sir, let me now summarise our fiscal position for both financial year 2023 and 2024. For financial year 2023, our revenue collections were better than expected, and this was mainly due to higher corporate income tax collections. The additional revenue will allow us to pay for new spending, including the $7.5 billion injection to the Majula Package Fund. Accounting for both our revenue upside and higher spending, we expect to end financial year 2023 with a deficit of $3.6 billion or 0.5% of GDP. For financial year 2024, we are budgeting a small surplus of $0.8 billion or 0.1% of GDP, which is essentially a balanced fiscal position. The overall stance is appropriate as we are providing targeted support for households and businesses, even as the economy is projected to operate at around potential. Mr. Speaker, let me conclude. Uh, we are living in a world which will become more violent, more fragmented, and more unpredictable in the years to come. We wish this were not so. We will try our best, working with others in the international community, to shape better global outcomes. But we also have to be realistic. Great catastrophes often seem unthinkable until they happen. Things may well get worse before they get better. So let us be mentally prepared and take steps now to adapt to this messy world. This is not the first time that we've found ourselves in such a situation. Since our independence, we've had to adjust to all sorts of external disruptions and shocks. The British deciding to withdraw troops from Singapore in 1967, the global oil crises in 1973 and 79, the Asian financial crisis in 1997, the dot-com bust in the early 2000s, 9-11, SARS, the global financial crisis of 2008, and of course, more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic. Each time, we were able to weather the storms and emerge stronger. I believe we can do so again in our road ahead, so long as we stay united, work together, and continue to keep faith in each other. Budget 2024 is about acting on this belief. We are helping Singaporeans with their cost of living concerns. We are taking major steps to advance our Forward Singapore agenda. We will grow the economy, we must, for growth is the prerequisite to create better jobs and raise living standards for all. We will equip everyone to realise their full potential and ensure that everyone benefits from our nation's progress. We will strengthen our system of risk pooling and social support so that Singaporeans can be better assured through every life stage and better equipped to bounce back from every setback. We will fortify our resilience, solidarity and unity so that we remain strong and effective against any challenges or threats. We are not the only country 
adapting to a different world. Countries everywhere are searching for solutions too. Many find it hard to implement bold and long-term plans, but we can make it happen in Singapore. We are able to do so because our fiscal position is healthy and sustainable. Our government has the trust of Singaporeans. Our people are united and our social compact is strong. These are the critical ingredients behind the Singapore story. What we have today is rare, remarkable and unique. Let us cherish it, treasure it and harness these strengths to remain a shining red dot in a troubled world. During the dark days of COVID-19, which feels like a bad dream to all of us now, I visited Riverside Secondary School. The teacher asked the students to imagine what they would be doing in 10 years' time and to write a letter to their future selves. One student, Levin Ong, wrote, and I quote, Dear future Levin, I hope you have been well in these past 10 years. I'm grateful for how Singapore is dealing with COVID-19. The challenges I face are small compared to others during this difficult time. I want the world to be a better place and contribute back to society to the best of my ability. I hope by 2030, I have made a better world for everyone. Hope for the future, giving back to society, each one of us doing our best to make this a better place for all. That's what this is about. Mr. Speaker, let us draw inspiration from young Singaporeans like Levin, move forward with confidence and build our shared future together. Sir, I beg to move. The question is that Parliament approves the financial policy of the government for the financial year 1st April 2024 to 31st March 2025. In accordance with paragraph 1 of Standing Order number 89, the debate now stands adjourned. Adjourned. DPM. Debate to be adjourned. From tax cuts to green energy transition support to skills development initiatives and a push to reduce wage gaps in society. You've been watching Finance Minister Lawrence Wong deliver the Singapore Budget 2024, a balanced budget and the first instalment in Singapore's roadmap to a more resilient future to the tune of some $131.4 billion dollars. Now that figure is comparable to last year's budget. Included in that total, $8.2 billion for retirement and healthcare and $9.3 billion to support businesses and drive growth. A budget that the finance minister and DPM Wong says looks after everyone and one that lays the groundwork for Singapore's long-term competitiveness in a world more fragmented and more unpredictable to come. Now, let's take a closer look at the key highlights of measures announced today. Taxpayers can expect income tax rebates of 50% this year, capped at a maximum of 200 Singapore dollars, as authorities look to address cost of living concerns. Now, the move will cost the government some $350 million. Homeowners can also expect to pay lower property tax with changes to the annual value bans. And for instance, those who live in properties with an annual value of $12,000 currently pay 4% in property tax, but from January next year, they won't have to pay any property tax. That's if their annual value stays the same. The adjustments come amid a change in market trends from 2022 when a two-step increase in property tax rates was announced. Prior to that budget announcement, market rents had been rel relatively flat for the preceding five years. But from 2022 onwards, market rents increased significantly due to the combination of strong de demand and COVID-related supply constraints. As a result, the annual values or the AVs also increased sharply. 
We had originally expected the property tax changes to impact mainly the top 7% of owner-occupied residential properties. Uh, the AV increases resulted in the proportion of affected owner-occupied properties nearly doubling to 13%. The new changes in annual values are meant to ensure that those living in higher value homes continue to pay their fair share of taxes. Singapore is also aligning with changes in the international tax landscape. From January next year, firms with a global revenue of at least 750 million euros must pay 15% tax on their local or overseas profits, depending on where their headquarters are. The additional revenues gained from these tax increases will be reinvested for Singapore to stay competitive. We will also have to spend more to support new investments, research and innovation activities and sustain our economic competitiveness. Overall, given the significant spending required to stay competitive at this point, I do not expect the new moves to generate net revenue gains for Singapore on a sustained basis. Singapore will set aside 3.2 billion Singapore dollars to tackle immediate challenges that households as well as businesses are facing. That says real incomes declined and economic growth slowed last year. The Deputy Prime Minister, Lawrence Wong, says that there are still uncertainties in this year's outlook. Uh, 1.9 billion Singapore dollars will go toward enhancing the assurance package for households. All Singaporean households will get an additional $600 in Community Development Council vouchers. Some 2.5 million adults will also receive between 200 and 400 Singapore dollars in cash as a one-off cost of living special payment eligible HDB households. They will also get additional one-off rebates on utilities, as well as service and conservancy charges. Another $1.3 billion is set aside for an enterprise support package to help firms manage rising costs. Companies will receive a 50% corporate income tax rebate for this year of assessment, capped at 40,000 Singapore dollars. More loans are also available with the ceiling raised for small and medium enterprises borrowing for cash flow needs. Support has also been extended for businesses going global, as well as construction firms. And to encourage transformation, the one-off skills future enterprise credit of up to $10,000 will be extended to next June. The enhanced assurance package and the enterprise support package will provide some near-term relief to Singaporean households and firms. These are needed during this period when inflation, while moderating, remains on the high side. But they are not permanent solutions. In the longer term, the best way to deal with inflation is to ensure that our firms and workers are more productive and that real incomes continue to rise sustainably. Eligible families who need to rent temporary public housing while waiting for their build-to-order flats to be ready will soon also have access to HDB flats in the open market. Now, it's part of the government's efforts to support families across all life stages. Qualifying households under the Parenthood Provisional Housing Scheme can soon get a voucher to help with the open market rental. The new voucher scheme will run for a year. Currently, HDB offers subsidized rental housing under the Parenthood Provisional Housing Scheme, or the PPHS. HDB receives many such applications for the scheme and it is ramping up supply to meet the demand. <coughs> but in the interim, we do want to do more to support such young families with urgent housing needs. There are also plans to make preschools more affordable. Starting next year, the maximum monthly childcare fees that preschools are allowed to charge will be reduced to 640 Singapore dollars for anchor operators and 680 Singapore dollars for partner operators. The caps will be lowered further in 2026. The government will also boost preschool subsidies for lower-income families and top up the EduSafe Endowment Fund by 2 billion Singapore dollars. 
For persons with special needs or disabilities, the government will cut the monthly fee cap at special education schools to $96. And that's down from the current $150. Fee caps at special student care centres will also be lowered. Now, Singapore will close the CPF special accounts for those aged 55 and above starting early next year. It's one of the two accounts that holds savings intended for citizens to use when they retire. And this is among a slew of measures announced to bolster retirement support for seniors and make sure that they are well taken care of in their golden years. Those eligible for the Enhanced Retirement Sum, or ERS, can save more to their retirement account to a maximum of $426,000, four times more than the amount needed for basic retirement. The remaining SA savings will be transferred to the ordinary account. Of course, members can voluntarily transfer these OA savings to the RA at any time, up to the revised ERS to earn higher interest and to receive higher retirement payouts. A wider group of seniors will also be able to receive more help, and that's as more are pumped into support schemes and qualification thresholds are lowered. Seniors who earn up to $6,000 per month will receive a yearly bonus of $1,000 for as long as they work. Under new bonuses from the Majula package, eligible seniors can also expect one-off bonuses of up to $1,500, both in retirement savings and in Medisafe. In all, the Majula package will benefit about 1.6 million Singaporeans at a total lifetime cost of $8.2 billion. To honour this commitment without burdening future generations, I will set aside $7.5 billion in a new fund, the Majula Package Fund, and this will be sufficient to cover the lifetime cost of the package after accounting for in investment income of the fund. Plus, a leg up for Institute of Technical Education students to further their studies. To spur more of them to pursue a diploma, they'll receive a $5,000 top-up to their post-secondary education accounts. And upon attaining the diploma, another $10,000 to their CPF ordinary accounts, which gives them a head start to buy a home or for retirement. In fact, the vast majority of Singaporeans in the Forward Singapore engagements welcome broader definitions of success. We want more diverse pathways so that every individual can strive to be the best possible version of themselves. Uh, this also means we must accord greater value to those who are skilled in technical hands-on abilities, as well as those with the social and empathetic traits to excel in service jobs. In particular, the wages and career prospects of our ITE graduates should not be too far below their polytechnic and university-going peers. And on that point about providing more support for young ITE graduates to succeed, we have our reporter Aslam Shah live from Tamasic Polytechnic. Aslam? Yes, uh, Glenda, exciting announcements for those who are intending to pursue a diploma education. I'm here at Tamasic Polytechnic's School of Engineering, where many ITE graduates are now pursuing their diploma education, including Matthew Francis Thanaraju, who is a year three student in the, uh, pursuing mechatronics. Now, uh, Matthew, uh, more in the post-secondary education accounts for uh, ITE uh, graduates who pursue diploma education. Now, how will this incent incentivize them to actually take up the diploma courses? Uh, I think for me, IT, my PSEA funds were used to pay off my IT uh, course funds or the course the funds, yeah. So I think um, when I went on to poly, the diploma course, uh, there was the PSA funds were uh, wasn't enough to pay off my diploma course. So I think this will definitely help to alleviate some of the financial burdens and worries that uh, students may want to or students that they want to pursue a diploma will have. So in, in addition to that, there will also be a CPF top up if students complete their diploma education. Now, how will this be useful uh, for youths like you at this stage of your life? I think since most IT students are a lot older than the rest of the students, um, 
since we also will start work a lot later, this will help us alleviate some of our worries when we decide to plan to buy a BTO or apply for BTO or buy a house. Yeah, so I think this would be very helpful for them and for me as well. Okay, overall, you have gone through the IT education and now you are completing your polytechnic education and uh, going to get your diploma soon. Now, overall, um, how beneficial has it been for you in your future aspirations in deciding to go for a diploma after completing ITE? I think uh, this diploma course that I've taken uh, has provided me with a lot of uh, learning, industry-relevant learning opportunities, uh, especially with work skills. It has helped me narrow down a lot of um, my aspirations and passions. And I guess I know more, more, more than not what I want to do in the future. Here I have it. I've been speaking with Matthew Francis Tanaraju, a year three student at Tomasic Polytechnic. All right, many thanks there, Adlam Shah, live from Tomasic Polytechnic there. Indeed, you know, we've heard from Matthew there. So, you know, it helps um, to alleviate the financial costs as well as a leg up in terms of, you know, the CPF injection. And um, it's also, you know, something about, uh, you know, telling students that it's a lifelong learning. You don't just stop there. You know, you continue with your education. Walter, an ITE graduate there, Matthew, to encourage IT graduates to upskill efforts, the new IT Progression Award. I want to get this right. It is a substantial amount because it's $5,000 top up to their post-secondary education accounts if they enroll in a diploma program. And then following that, $10,000 to their CPF if they attain their diplomas. How significant is this new ITE progress, progress, Progression Award how far do you see this going into closing now then this wage gap? So, so I think this uh, award is really important because one of the challenges I think facing uh, an IT graduate today is that they're going to have to choose do they want to start their career immediately or do they want to continue furthering their studies, right? And the, the problem with that choice is that if they choose to continue furthering their studies, first, they need to come up with the money for their studies and second, it means they're going to fall behind a bit, right, compared to their peers in terms of saving up for their flat, marriage, that kind of thing. And so this is really critical because I think it, it solves both those problems at once. You don't worry so much about the tuition bills and you also are placed on a more even uh, footing when it comes to affording your first house and so on. So I think that's really critical. But we still also have to look, I think, at the wage gaps as well. Of course, we have to make sure that when they do start their careers, they catch up much faster with diploma and uh, university grads as well. All right. Speaking of that, you know, Tana Lechmi, what do you think of the budget in terms of this um, social mobility, as you know, especially for the lower income workers here? Yeah, I think the budget has been worker centric. Mm. Uh, uh, in much of the way that is inclusive towards low-wage workers and also middle-income workers. So I can cite a few things like Skills Future Level Up Program. I think for people who are 40 and above, uh, they, it's very beneficial. And I remember earlier we spoke about mid-career switches. So I think it will really support uh, the advancement of this, uh, of this group of people who want to build up their, their work prospects. Uh, the other aspect is, I think, uh, a wish list of unemployment uh, support. I, the details are not out yet, mm. but at least, you know, uh, DPM did mention that. And uh, we can see light at the end of the tunnel because that's what uh, the involuntary retrenched workers want. Uh, the, the other part is the increase in CPF. Mm. For people who are 55 to 65 by 1.5 percentage point, I think this is significant. Because uh, retirement advocacy, it has been a top-notch topic among the uh, matured workers. Uh, progressive wage credit, I think, is also indirectly helps the workers because uh, for sectors that are PWM, like cleaning, landscape, and many other retail sectors, uh, what it means is uh, the companies can now go on track with what has been planned progressively until 2030, where we aim to have uh, the wages of low-wage workers to be two-thirds of median wage. Mm. So you, you don't retard that progress. So by giving this support, I think, uh, in fact, all companies can help support uh, increasing the salaries of the low-wage workers progressively towards 2030, two-thirds uh, median salary, two-thirds of the median salary.
Yeah, beyond just closing this, um, you know, wage gap, Walter, there's also, uh, you know, a deeper emphasis here now um, in this multiple pathways to success, you know, highlighted um, in this year's budget. Why this emphasis? And, you know, mm -hmm. is it enough to help people with different skills and ability to help move up this um, social ladder here? So, so I think the most, re uh, most important reason why we need to recognise that there are diverse pathways to the success is that we basically need Singaporeans across all skill levels, all backgrounds, right, to not just contribute to Singapore, but also to feel that they're being rewarded appropriately for their contributions. And I think DPM pointed out that unfortunately for far too long, there has been some structural differences in the kinds of rewards that people get, uh, you know, by based on your education level, right, and the kinds of jobs you have access to. So if we don't correct that if we don't put, uh, you might say, our money where our mouth is, right, then I think we, we can't really convince people that we really value their contribution to Singapore, uh, that they're able to, you know, afford a home and, and basically fund their families on the same basis as other Singaporeans who are working just as hard. So we really need to do a lot there. Uh, but I think there I just want to zoom in on one thing which, which we're doing, I think, which is to really try to upgrade the incomes of uh, low-wage workers, and not just through the progressive wage model, but also through increased support for uh, increasing the funding for the workfare in income supplement, for example. I think that will go some way, as well as, of course, the Comlink Plus uh, program, where they're going to be giving some additional benefits mm. to uh, low-wage families and, and rental flats especially, who are able to take up employment to give them a bit of a leg up so that they can start building uh, those resources for their families. So all of this is about being more inclusive, about making sure Singaporeans can maximise their opportunities. Right. Yeah, one other point about the LQS, uh, Local Qualifying Salary. I think... Uh, uh, Labour Party is delighted to hear that it is up from 2004 to 2006. It means a lot to low-wage workers, especially companies who hire foreigners. Now, the locals have to be starting, their starting salary will have to commence at 2006. Mm -hmm. So, which is, uh, in fact, we, uh, we welcome that move. Right. You know, um, Walter, I want to pick up on the Comlink, right? You know, and the preschool subsidies to uphold these um, mm. social mobility, additional support will be provided for eligible low-income families with young children through Comlink and progress packages. But don't we already have these various subsidies? Why do we need this? And, you know, and for that matter, does it do enough? Is this enough? Right. So, so I think certainly when it comes to, for example, subsidies for uh, early childhood, childhood education, we already do have extensive subsidies in place. But I think there's been a sense in recent years that because of the increases in cost of living and so on, there's always a need to keep calibrating these. Because if you don't do that, then in a sense, the market runs away with you, right? I mean, the market is to raise uh, prices and so on. And you find that even if you target it an initial subsidy level, people start saying all of a sudden, look, uh, my kids are costing me a lot more to raise than I thought they were going to. I just can't afford it and so on. So you want to try to, I think, uh, reduce the uncertainty because that's really what I think uh, maybe harms fertility in Singapore, right? You start hearing from your friends who have more kids that they can't afford it and so on, and you start wondering, can I actually afford them myself? So I think we have to make sure we're always on top of the subsidies and support we're giving mm. so that it is calibrated right and that people don't have this uncertainty that they just can't afford the kids you already have, for example. Right. And with the subsidies and supporting the needs of these young families, you know, reducing, we're seeing here, childcare fee caps, yeah. enhancing preschool subsidies. Is this enough for families to consider having more babies or even for that matter, you know, starting a family? Well, I think, you know, it's a very individual decision. I think uh, basically government can do quite a lot, society can do quite a lot, I think, to support this. But ultimately, I think it's up to the individual. Do they feel confident in their future? Do they feel that their kids are going to have, you know, a good future in Singapore? I think that's really what we have to concentrate on. Of course, cost of living is a big concern, but I think it's about, you know, it's about signaling that the Singapore that your kids are going to have 10 or 20 years in the future is going to be the kind of place you would enjoy seeing them grow up in. I think that's the most important thing. So yeah, we have to take care of the cost of living concerns today, but I think we also have to invest in, you know, our future and sustainability, for mm. example, to convince people that there will be a future for their children 10 or 20 years' time. Right, speaking of that future, you know, many of these shifts on supporting ITE graduates and retrenched workers, you know, it came through the discussions with Singaporeans in the Forward Singapore exercise. Now, to give us a recap, some of these outcomes, Let's go to Dawn to tell us more. Dawn. Thanks, Glenda. 
Well, much has been said about Forward Singapore or Forward SG. Here's a recap of the outcomes from this series of national feedback discussions that were conducted by the government. Uh, it was started by the 4G leaders, led by DPM Lawrence Wong, to refresh Singapore's social compact. That's the glue that holds society together. It's also to chart a roadmap for Singapore in the next decade and beyond. Uh, this is a time is at a time of rising global tensions, a rapidly aging population here in Singapore, as well as concerns of slowing social mobility. Uh, from the conversations with Singaporeans, seven key policy shifts were identified in areas like education, jobs, healthcare, as well as social welfare. In education, the focus is on going beyond grades to developing life skills. There will be more new pathways to succeed as well as reskilling and upskilling of adult workers. For jobs, the aim is to reduce wage gaps further among all professions and education backgrounds, including those from ITE. And it means better pay for heart and hands roles, such as tradespeople or those in the care sector. The report also highlighted more support for retrenched workers. Focus also on vulnerable individuals, those from lower income families and persons with disabilities. More will be done to create inclusive environments for them to live independently and improve their lives. And as, for the pop, as, as this population ages, Singaporeans want to age well. This means redeploying resources towards more primary and preventive care in the community, as well as promoting healthier lifestyles through national programs like Healthier SG. Now let's get back to my panel here. And Selena, I want to get to you first, because earlier we heard from our other guests their views on what is being done in order to close the wage gap between university grads and poly grads and ITE students. I mean, it is considerable. And the finance minister has said that it really needs to close, not just for them, but even he wants to be able to raise wages across all sectors, he mentioned. Uh, today, the median salary, the starting salary for university grads is about twice that, in fact, mm -hmm. for ITE students. I want you, Selena, as an economist, your point of view as to why it is that closing that gap is so important for Singapore's economy going forward? Well, I think there is growing recognition that you know the rising tide actually lifts all boats, but it may lift some boats more than the others. And in order to build this refreshed social compact, you know, basically where you know Singaporeans are united, they are all respected and they all do meaningful jobs to be an inclusive society, I think there is a need basically to uplift the ITE uh, graduates and to also give them aspirations that they can continue to upskill and retrain and to move on to further education. And in turn, they will be you know, uh, presented with uh, opportunities uh, in growth industries, with jobs that are in demand, and they will receive higher paying jobs. I think the key really is not to pigeonhole them based on the academic qualifications alone, but this also means that, you know, mindsets of the employers, especially the HR departments, have to change. And uh, it really, you know, it has to be a partnership process. There has to be collaboration. There has to be more forward thinking. Yeah. And yet, making every pathway in employment rewarding to workers, it sounds very ideal. It's going to be a tough ask, in fact. I mean, that theoretically, though, should boost productivity, right, if, if we were to do that. But boosting productivity is something that we have grappled a long time with here in Singapore. How does reshaping the labour market in that way uh, by sort of closing that gap, how is that going to impact smaller businesses? Yeah, I think um, what I can do is I share a few data points and then we can discuss a little, right? I think that uh, there's an observation we, we, we observed um, from the HR perspective. We've got HR practitioners that looked at um, the fact that when, you, when there's job interviews and there's rain, what happens is that a lot of the lower tier um, job seekers don't show up for the interview. And why I'm saying that is because when we talk about reskilling and upskilling, I think there may be other areas that we want to address as well. Mm. You know, mindset and mentality, that's one part. Um, what we, on the broader sense, when we're looking at the overall um, initiatives from Skills Future, I think it's a great initiative because when we broaden it and improve the skill set and ability of the workforce, it's going to ultimately translate to businesses. 
right? Now, the concern is really about short term now. As we try to boost the um, workforce training and retraining, you're going to get a bit of irregularities, movement in staff, yeah. right? And that's one of the concerns about that I can see as a risk for SMEs this year and maybe the next few years. This will mean that businesses would need to not only look at leveraging on the incoming uh, newer skills that people may come into the market with, at the same time, they must strengthen their current um, human capital practices to ensure that they can retain their workers or they can maybe upgrade them as well. So I think that's what the challenge is. So none of these things happen in isolation, right, Selena? When it comes to an economy, it really is a living organism in many ways. It touches everybody's lives in different ways. But for wages to rise in tandem with productivity, and, and we're talking about the longer term here as well, because that's our concern here in Singapore. Uh, the, the finance minister spoke about improving wage levels across many sectors, not just, not just in lower wage work. That's also going to be an inflationary cost as well. When, when, the, when there's so much tightness in, in the labour market, you, there is the risk of inflation too. Well, there's a bit of a trade-off between the short term and the medium term. I mean, uh, Finance Minister DPM uh, did say that this is about building the capabilities and the engines of growth for medium term growth. So I think we do recognise that you know, there will be some short-term pain, especially in terms of the wage uh, increase, which may not come at an opportune time for a lot of the local businesses, especially the SMEs. But I think the rationale really is that if you give uh, higher wages to all the workers, they are incentivized to continue to reskill and upskill. The productivity goes up. Um, that improves the profit margins for businesses. That attracts more investments and more foreign talent to come to Singapore. And in turn, you have a vibrant economy with uh, you know, vibrant job creation. And so it's going to be a virtuous cycle. So I think that's really the line of thinking. We cannot look at the skills future top up or the uh, ITE uh, you know, incentives in isolation. Really is to try and position Singapore for the challenges of this uh, new economy in a world that is violent, fragmented and messy. Right. Well, the issue is we, we, we do want to talk about the Gini coefficient here because the impact for consumers on narrowed wage gaps uh, is that they must be able to be willing to pay more as well, right, for certain sectors. I mean, if they're going to get, if they're going to get, if wages are going to go up, the cost of goods and services is going to go up as well. Uh, it isn't an easy conversation to have, though, uh, when you're telling people, you know, my wages at a certain level, uh, the, the stick price of everything is, is higher. Uh, what exactly can be done in, in light of that? I think that, you know, the immediate answer is really transformation. Um, businesses have to, right now, looking at this broad, broad direction and trend, look at how to re-engineer their business. And uh, while they can tap on uh, manpower and there's going to be manpower cost increase, um, at the same time, there is also going to be a market challenge this year, as we foresee. A uh, market looks like it's going to be soft. And in light of all this and with cost pressure, how do you then carve a way forward? And I think for many businesses, it, they got to step back and rethink and how to restructure their organization in some cases, relook at their human capital practice, and then maybe double down in certain areas where transformation is going to make a significant impact to their costs and to their productivity. Yeah. Selena, is it more than just the right thing to do when we're talking about, you know, continuing to close that wage inequality in Singapore? I think, um, you know, it's very important that we don't have disenfranchised segments of society in Singapore. I mean, we see in some other countries that creates a sense of uh, disquiet and social unrest potentially. So I think, you know, to build this inclusive society that is the uh, ambition of the 4G leadership, um, a lot of these guardrails have to be put in place. Uh, we see it through the, you know, WIS uh, increases. We see it through what they're doing uh, to try and uh, continuously upskill the workers. So I think a lot of this fiscal transfers is helping to try and bring the Gini coefficient down. But a lot of weight is also being put on fiscal transfers. And this is probably where the role of government steps in, because the, if you look at the sure amount of fiscal transfers that's going to the lower, even to the low mid-income households, that has really gone up by uh, leaps and bounds over the years. 
Um, Singapore is a fairly interventionist uh, government in that sense. Um, they don't leave it to market chance. Well, hold that thought right there, Selena. We have to go for a break, but we will be back with more. Stay with us on our coverage of Budget 2024. And you're watching CNA special coverage of Singapore's Budget 2024. Let's check in with our team at Parliament House. Well, Clara Lee is tracking all the measures to help businesses and workers. And Rebecca Mateo focusing on social support. First to Clara. Clara, the government says that this year's budget aims to tackle immediate concerns while establishing plans to create a brighter future for Singaporeans. What are some of the key highlights that we've heard in this budget? Well, addressing rising cost of living concerns is definitely on the key agenda. And thanks to revenue upside, owing to stronger economic rebound, DPM Wong says that they are able to provide more assistance this time around. But equally significant was the large effort in making sure that Singapore stays competitive. It's not just supporting businesses, but also laying the foundation to make sure that they will thrive. Now, heard earlier in the speech, these measures range from corporate income tax rebates to financing schemes as well. And they're 
also trying to get firms to focus on longer term priorities, such as developing AI and R&D. Now, taking the same approach to raising Singaporean workers' capabilities, they also rolled out a slew of measures to incentivize them to upgrade themselves, continue learning and to get higher certifications. Now, to break down some of these measures, I have with me the chairman of the Parliamentary Committee for Finance, Trade and Industry, Lang Yinghua. Now, thank you so much for having us, Mr. Liang. The first question I wanted to ask is business associations were quite wary going into budget. So how much of DPM Wong's speech do you think allayed their concerns? Well, at uh, $1.3 billion, uh, the enterprise support package, I would think is a substantial one. And I hope that the businesses will find them useful. Uh, among others, you have the, uh, the tax rebate for the companies up to 50%. Uh, even non-profitable companies will get a payout of $2,000. Uh, there's also the enhancement to the enterprise financing scheme, where the maximum uh, working capital loan quantum was raised to uh, is, is raised to half dollars And there's also the project finance resharing, uh, which has been extended. And, and these are, if you take it in totality, together with the other schemes, uh, the productivity grants, the various schemes over there, uh, the green transition, the skills uh, training support grant, the wage subsidy support grant. I, I think it does in some way help the businesses and I hope that businesses can find ways to claim those grants. But more importantly also, uh, we not only want to help the businesses with the cost, but also we want to help them improve the top line. Uh, we want to, the economy to continue to grow, uh, to be vibrant so that there are always uh, uh, demands for their businesses. There's always a uh, good sales order coming in for them. Uh, so you, you need to work on the cost as well as the overall uh, economy uh, uh, growth uh, potential. Now, of course, there were measures that tackled more immediate concerns, but also more structural measures. So do you think there were enough to cover both aspects? And how effective do you think they will be in the current global climate? Well, they, we, we do face uh, some more immediate uh, challenges on the cost of living side and then also the uh, uh, more structural one where we are on this transition to raise the wages of Singaporeans. So it does add cost to businesses, uh, which is why there, there we have some further targeted measure and enhancement to uh, the existing scheme. So for example, the, on the cost of living for households, uh, I think the, 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 the enhancements to uh, the SNCC to the USAID for help the households, uh, the CDC uh, uh, grants a uh, cash cash payout of six hundred dollars, uh, and as well as the uh, cost of living grant of two hundred to four hundred dollars. I think all this will help in some way to 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 help the uh, the household cope with the rising costs. But I would think that the uh, uh, important to work on is really uh, to uplift the productivity of, uh, and uh, so that and, and the skill sets of, of Singaporeans so that they can become more employable, uh, so that there are further scope to increase the wages. Uh, and that will help in some way to mitigate the rising costs. For sure. Thank you so much, Mr. Liang. That was Liang Enghua, the chairman of the Parliamentary Committee for Finance, Trade and Industry. And for more on the support granted to IT graduates, couples as well as families, my colleague Rebecca Mateo will be providing you with the latest in just a bit. All right. Thanks very much, Clara. Clara Lee there reporting live for us from Parliament. Rebecca, so more support for Institute of Technical Education graduates, families, as well as seniors. It's on the way. Tell us about these plans. Right, Glenda, one of the aims of this year's budget was to boost equality and social mobility. We saw moves in this direction just a short while ago with incentivizing IT graduates to get higher qualifications. But there's also assurances for young families and lower-income families, like enhancing preschool subsidies for lower-income families. Now, against the backdrop of ageing population and longer life expectancy, Singapore also wants to ensure that its seniors age well and that they have enough in their retirement savings to get by. DPM Wong says that these form a commitment to address the needs of families and seniors through every stage of life and these are long-term plans and in fact he says that he calls this year's budget as the first installment of the Forward Singapore programs hinting at similar approach over the next few years. And for more I have, MP, I have Ting Pei Ling who is from the Government Parliamentary Committee for Social and Family Development. She is also the MP for Macpherson SMC. Right 
Right, Ms. Tin, my first question for you is, you know, the government has committed to doing more, but DPM Wong also emphasised that other parts of the society also need to do more. Does this mark a shift in the way Singapore supports its Singaporeans? I think, first of all, the government remains committed to supporting Singaporeans through good times and bad times. But at the same time, Singapore's story has always been a collective effort. And in this case, as our country grows, as aspirations and needs diversify, uh, we also need to take into account account. These are also areas that resources have to come in as well. At the same time, our population have also been growing in a different way. They're more sophisticated, better educated, better capable. There are many others who have the resources, the ability and the will to want to give back and support others, fellow Singaporeans who are in need. And I think it is timely and necessary for us to facilitate this giving back as well. At the end of the day, a truly caring society and an inclusive one will require every everyone to put in an effort to make it come true. Right, and against a larger backdrop of geopolitical and economic uncertainty, how significant are the moves to ensure social mobility remains front and centre? I think a large emphasis from this year's budget is really about how can we put in the scaffolding to support our Singaporeans to go further and, and, and endure longer, uh, it, whether it's in terms of investments in the industries, the digital capabilities, the, the green capabilities, the skills of our people. I think all these are for the long term helping our people to, to have what it takes from the skills to the motivation, the intrinsic drive, to always keep ourselves updated regardless of the changes that may be happening around us. And I think that's the best way to inoculate us against the challenges of the future and to always position ourselves as being ready to reskill, uh, upskill and to you know, face the new challenges head on. And so I think this is the best way forward and I think this is also the emphasis of this year's budget. Yeah. Indeed, Singapore's future is one where everyone will have to do their part. There was Ding Pei Ling from the Government Parliamentary Committee for Social and Family Development. And that's our reporter Rebecca Mateo speaking to us live from Parliament. We heard there some early reactions from MPs on the announcements from Budget 2024. Let's hear more from our guests now and we'll start off with Selena Ling from OCBC. Selena, uh, just some figures from the... Um, the budget uh, basic def deficit position for Singapore was 5.4 billion, 0.8% um, of GDP last year. Mm -hmm. The overall fiscal position is a deficit of 3.6 billion, that's 0.5% of GDP for this year. Uh, but it is larger than the 0.4 billion deficit that was estimated at budget 2023. So we're spending more, I mean, total expenditure last year, about $2.7 billion higher mm. than was estimated in the 2023 figure. Now, the size of the budget, though, for this year is comparable to last year's, in, in, just in quantum. How much flexibility does the government have, the wiggle room, to actually, uh, you know, to make decisions about where the, the finance minister allocates mm. all of this spending? Okay, I think just to give some context to the FY2023 uh, outturn, um, actually, tax revenues were quite buoyant, especially from the corporate income tax side. But we did have a huge top up to the Majula package fund, yeah. right? So that contributed to the reason why we actually still have a fiscal deficit for FY23. If not, it probably would have been a surplus, a modest surplus. And then for FY2024, um, you know, uh, there is still growth in terms of our expenditures because of all these. Uh, schemes and incentives and uh, grants that uh, the government plans to do, which explains why uh, you know there's a little bit of a tussle between uh, revenue growth and also expenditure growth. So the target is for a fairly balanced budget in that sense. I think it's a good start. Um, there is still emphasis on fiscal discipline. So while we have a little bit of leeway because GST just went up uh, in January this year, we do expect some cooling off in some of the asset taxes, for instance, and especially on the property market side, which is also cooling. So I think net-net, you know, it's going to be a fairly balanced, but quite a tight position, I would say. And then looking forward, how do we continue to plan for, you know, what we need to do for the ageing population and competitiveness? I think it would require a little bit uh, of skillful manoeuvring. I mean, he, he did allude to the fact that out to 2020, uh, 2030, we should be okay but beyond that, you know, uh, it may require some uh, rethink of the overall framework again, I suspect. 
Yeah, this is only the first instalment, as That's we right. were saying earlier. And as the finance minister said, it, it implies that there are several other instalments to go, uh, the details of which uh, remain to be seen. But uh, uh, there was also some moves by way of corporate tax changes uh, in this budget, uh, a substantial corporate tax rebate as well. Uh, the government is also co-funding loans, especially for local SMEs, uh, for energy efficiency, as an example. How crucial are those moves in the midst of what we're seeing in a climate of high inflation, as well as the increased, the increased cost of doing business? Yeah, I think that uh, one of the, the things that I shared earlier as a concern is really the, the situation on the market that it's not looking really rosy. And uh, having uh, this initiative around the corporate in in income tax, as well as a component on $2,000 of, of, uh, of cash rebate, right, a minimum sum, I think it's recognition that um, businesses may not do great, great, and at least for those that are borderline, they still get some support in that area. So I think that's a good move. Mm. Uh, an area that could maybe be enhanced in this area is maybe even to look at tiering it. Of course, maybe, you know, COS may have more details, but uh, it's a move in the general right direction. Now, when it comes to uh, finance, um, there are companies, even in this high interest rate situation, are running into tight cash flow situations, yeah. or they may just want to have a standby loan to be ready to tap onto should they run low on cash. And I think having this extension and even having going from three hundred to five hundred thousand for the working capital, I think it's a very good move to allow companies to stay afloat, stay financed, and tap into that when yeah. they need to. Right. Now, considering uh, that the budgets have have gotten bigger over the years, Selena. Uh, corporate and personal income tax, it continues to be the lion's share, contributing to operating revenue at least. I mean, and GST alone contributed about 15.7%, a bit weaker mm. because of weak imports. Are the GST and the revenues that we're seeing, though, coming in, you know, the, what you want, right, the deposits, are they enough? Is there a possibility that we might need to increase taxes further? Well, I think the possibility is there. Um, it really depends on what's the state of the economy going forward. Uh, we had a nice surprise on the corporate income revenue side uh, last year. Whether that's going to be repeated today, uh, this year remains to be seen, mainly because although top-line GDP growth is expected to improve, you know, but at around 2%, it's still a little bit on the low end of the 2 to 3% uh, medium-term growth scenario that was painted. I think at the end of the day, you know, it's a check and balance issue, you need to, you have some certain aspirations of what you want to spend on. And of course, uh, there is expectations from the ground as well, both from the businesses as well as the households. But on the other hand, if you want to maintain fiscal discipline, you want to make sure you have a balanced budget over mm. the term of government. You want to put the money in the right places, you know, like for fighting climate change and for a green economy, etc. Not just the short term, let's make people happy or businesses happy kind of a story. Then there's a little bit of that, you know, uh, game that uh, needs to be, at the end of the day, you need to square everything. Yeah. And the move, I mean, on your point about uh, clean energy uh, and also climate change, Singapore's efforts to decarbonize, they've been accelerating, but not every company in every, of every size has been on board with this. I mean, it's been a bit, perhaps a bit easier for the medium size and the larger companies to invest in those technologies that they need. Uh, of course, our, our goals are net zero carbon emissions by 2050. I mean, that date quickly coming forward. There had been hopes that there might be more moves to incentivize these smaller companies to be able to adapt more quickly to sustainability standards. And yet, when you see uh, what has been you know, announced today, and especially with the, the loans as well towards smaller companies, uh, can you comment on whether you think that that stimulus is there? I think um, you know broadening the um, efficiency, energy efficiency grant to cover more sectors as well as uh, the green loans. I think it's a, it's a move in the right direction. I think that uh, more could be done, and perhaps we'll, we'll hear more announcement in COS, um, especially around uh, the area of uh, standard uh, standards to be adopted, because there are a lot of standards out there, and even among the associations, we're trying to look at what's what's there to actually apply for the basic ones for SMEs. Yeah. But we all know that this is the direction we want to go into. The other area is uh, how do you incentivize um, consumer demand for it, 
right? Could you get consumers to buy more if you're sustainable? And that will make a difference to the business because business fundamentally uh, want to look at how revenue is going to drive that behavior. And uh, that's something that we think uh, would also move the needle if, if, if implemented. Mm. I think at Same. the end of the day, it's a bit of a carrot and stick. I mean, we have to remember that the carbon taxes will go up further from 2026 onwards, from the current $25 to $45, mm. and maybe yeah. even to $80 in time to come. So I think the incentive actually is for all the companies to get on board with this shift towards sustainability. Yeah, the national AI strategy story as well. Another narrative mm. that companies are having to grapple with, and they really are, because not all of them necessarily know how they're going to deploy AI technologies. Some, of course, already are, but others, there is a concern about what AI will do. Assurance from the finance minister that not all jobs are going to be replaced by technology, but still, billions of dollars has been allocated to develop uh, Singapore's AI capacity. How is this going to go down with businesses, especially the smaller ones? Yes, and uh, this is something that we, we were saying uh, in our recommendation that, you know, uh, support and help should be given to the smaller businesses around AI transformation. And that way may mitigate some situation that they're dealing with in terms of manpower or costs. Right now, on the broad broad direction, I think the the nation is moving in the right direction to really drive an AI strategy. Now, how that flows down, I'm hoping that more of that will flow down to the SMEs and allow SMEs to actually leverage on to offset the current situation of uh, rising costs and and productivity challenges. But we do not know at this point, and uh, I look forward to more announcements in the COS on that. Yeah. So very very quickly, you know. Selena, same question to you with regards uh, the national strategy, the AI strategy, and, and just how much money you see being put into this area. It's a little bit of an arms race. I mean, he yeah. did mention about how you know certain countries for their economic uh, security reasons are deploying a huge funds into building uh, certain capabilities in areas. I think Singapore, you know, we, we started with like a smart nation strategy and this is a continuation, I think, of sorts towards uh, basically building the economic uh, strategy for Singapore. I think we have no choice. Um, we yeah. are a small economy. We really have to be maybe not right at the frontier, but you know, quite near the frontier when it comes to bringing the whole uh, economy and the businesses up to that scale in order to deliver value. At the end of the day, it's about you know, being able to attract investments. Yeah. If you do have an uh, AI you know, strategy, you can see what it does to individual stock prices already, right? Because people be believe that this is going to be the growth driver in the next five, ten years. Yeah, investment in AI becoming very quickly a must-have and not a nice-to-have in budgets. Uh, a quick final question to you about the quantum for social spending. I mentioned it earlier, 49.7%, uh, about, I think, $53 billion or so, dollars, if, I, if I'm not wrong, uh, what stood out to you in terms of, of, of that amount and, and where we're continuing to see this uh, amount, uh, Selena? Well, it's a fairly impressive amount. I think it really shows where the priorities are. It's not just the head, but really the heart. You know, at the end of the day, they want an inclusive and fair society. So a lot of effort and energy and resources is being put, I would say, whether it's from preschool education to you know, further education and to retirement, medical needs, aging population, etc. So if you really want to cover the entire spectrum, you know, from birth to death kind of a, a situation, I think we are quite fortunate uh, that so far the fiscal discipline that we've put in place has allowed us a fairly big piggy bank in terms of the NRRC drawdowns. Uh, we've had past reserves that came to the fore when uh, crisis strikes. But I think going ahead, um, like we talked about, there will be a fine balance between you know, trying to do all these things and still spending within our means. So it's not an easy task, I think, yeah. but uh, we shall see. Yeah, I mean, the hope with social spending, create that virtuous cycle That's right. that pays you back as well. Let's get over to Glenda. Thank you both, by the way. And uh, Glenda, you've been taking notes on what's been included for workers. Can you tell us more? Indeed, Don, and also announced in Budget 2024 to support retrenched workers. A temporary financial support scheme will help to tide them through. Now, details of which will be announced later this year. Losing a job is a major setback for workers and their families. 
Those who become involuntarily unemployed naturally feel the pressure to rush into the first available job they find. <laughs> but the new job may not always be a good fit. Ideally, they should consider ways to upgrade their skills and to find a job that fits their aptitude and talent. But displaced workers may not have the time to train or search for new jobs, especially when they are already straining to make ends meet. Well, the country is also pumping in more resources to close the wage gap and encourage lifelong learning. This includes giving all Singaporeans aged 40 and above a $4,000 top-up in Skills Future credits to spur them to upskill and reskill. It can be used for selected training programs promising better job opportunities. Examples include part-time and full-time diploma and undergraduate programs. We are making a significant enhancement to our skills future ecosystem. But we will reap the full benefits only if all of us, government employers, workers and unions, work, lean forward to truly deepen this culture of lifelong learning and skills mastery. This must be our shared commitment to one another, to help our fellow Singaporeans develop to their fullest potential and to have productive and meaningful careers. Well, earlier we managed to catch Calvin Lee, whom Finance Minister Lawrence Wong mentioned in his speech. He tells us why he went for upskilling. I feel that it's not just only going to learn, it's also allowing me to network or to know more people. So by doing so, I feel that it gives me more uh, opportunities to widen my network and to know more people, to actually allow more business opportunities to the company. So upskilling to help our workers, upskilling our workers for life, strengthening Singaporeans to develop to their fullest potential. There is a new Skills Future Level Up program to better support our mid-career workers with the various measures and um, allowances. Is this, do you think, is this addressing the issues and challenges of, number one, staying relevant? Is this addressing um, the issues and challenges of helping middle-aged workers adapt in this changing world? You know, we heard Dawn and her panel there, Agnew and Selena, talking about, you know, AI strategy. You know, it's here to stay. Tana yeah. Lakshmi, why don't I start with you? So, uh, as you know, the industries are transforming under the Industry Transformation Plan. And it's imperative that the uh, latest technology, technology, cutting-edge technology, AI, digitalization is going to be the in thing. And it is important that uh, our workers, uh, regardless of age, they have to be upskilled. Currency or knowledge must be there. But what is happening is a lot of time, the older workers are deprived from uh, going for training by the employers because maybe return of investment is not that good. Mm. So uh, maybe they have shorter runway. So that becomes an uh, impediment for older workers to gain more knowledge. I think uh, this uh, Skills Future Level uh, Up program actually can be one, as one avenue whereby they can turn to and uh, do self-upgrading mm. themselves. So and when you upskill yourself, and uh, under the lifelong learning, you know, uh, attributes that you have, you continue to upskill and reskill. I think you can get a very good job, good paying job, and that is the best security for every any worker. Uh, and if if you look at even um, companies, businesses, uh, a lot of time they look at qualification. I think we should we should uh, move away from paper chase and look at skill sets. What are the skill set that these workers have? You know, hands-on ability to uh, ability to be creative, ability to uh, tackle problem, having problem-solving attributes. So these are very important for them to stay in job and ensure that they are employable. So uh, I would say that <clears throat> earlier uh, in regard to the ITE uh, opportunity to upgrade to mm. diploma level. For IT graduates, I think this is a welcome move. But what is important is that IT graduates themselves have to be valued. If they enter a job market, what is the starting pay now? We have to acknowledge that they have the skill set. Can we pay them for the skill set rather than looking at the paper qualification that these are IT certs uh, compared to diploma cert? So I think we are not 
really there yet. We hope that uh, more and more companies will look at what a potential worker can bring to the company in terms of value proposition, skill sets, knowledge, uh, relevance to the company's requirement. That is important. So, uh, 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 labour movement is propagating. The NTUC is, 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 uh, is really advancing uh, this notion across uh, companies. So, we hope that eventually it, it will be a reality that mm. people will look at skill set, what skills you possess. And people uh, and workers can try to remain relevant in that aspect. Right. Well, talent, Walter, talent is our resource. And, you know, with so much upskilling, will this, let's look at this here, will this inevitably see a departure of talent where they are being perhaps maybe poached by, you know, other companies, right? Um, or will they themselves want to work um, overseas in, in the sense, you know, go for greener pastures there, you know. Will we not lose our talent in, in that sense? Well, I think if we end up in a situation, you know, where Singapore talent is highly thought after, not just in Singapore, but also in the region or globally, I would say that is a happy problem yeah. to have, right? It's yeah. a good problem to have for, for the workers, certainly, and I think also for brand Singapore. And I think what is important, actually, is that uh, if our talent happens to be thought over af after overseas, we provide the necessary pathways for them to go abroad for a while, for them to learn new skills, new experiences there, and so on, to gain seniority, but then also for them to come back. Mm. And this is something that was actually touched on a bit, actually, in previous year's budget teams, right, about things like, for example, supporting our younger talents, our university graduates, and so on, to go abroad and do these things when you're younger. But it seems that this is also important, I think, for mature workers as well. And in fact, maybe even more important to have that support because they're at the age where they really start worrying. I, I can't take this job overseas or whatever because I've got young children back at home. Mm -hmm. You know, how do I move them, uproot them and so on. So this may be something that we have to look at in future budgets perhaps. But again, you know, I think it's a happy problem to have if our workers are sought after globally. Right. Um, Thana Lechby, near DPM uh, Wong, he mentioned an introduction to this um, temporary uh, financial support scheme mm -hmm. for workers who, mm -hmm. you know, become involuntary unemployed yeah. and yeah. said that more details will yes. be announced. This is something, you know, you've been working with, you've been proposing, but more details will be announced later. Yeah. But what are your hopes? What's NTUC's hopes? What are these details that you hope to see? Yes. Actually, uh, uh, this, this issue came out of the Every Worker Matter conversation. So uh, those people who are uh, in, involuntarily unemployed, they, they, they find that it's difficult for them to search or look for ideal job. So what they do is they just apply and get a job that, that takes them on and that's the first job. Mm. It may not be an ideal job at all. So uh, eventually they may drop out or they may they not do well and they look for another job. So there's a lot of break in between. And what is important is during this, there's a lot of disruption to their financial stability. And uh, it is important that uh, we help them during this period probably three to six months, you know, just to ensure that there's a leg up for them. Uh, but what is interesting is that there is a twist to it that, yes, we will support, but we will support by giving the so-called uh, 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 support salary, but, but the person has to go for training, upgrading. He must know what training he wants to go to, what job what ideal job you want to go into. That is what NTUC is doing in helping yes, them. Yes, mentoring, you know, giving them guidance and uh, probably, you know, telling them, you know, E2I does a wonderful job in terms of uh, uh, making sure that the worker understands, you know, what he wants eventually out of the job and uh, what kind of skill set he has and what is lagging and what, what kind of training he must go to. So that kind of uh, conversation must take place and uh, I'm sure E2Y and WSC can do a lot more in this area to have that conversation for displaced workers and that, that leg up is uh, unemployment support and they don't have to think about their financial burden while they go for training and upgrading. Right. So that is a win-win for the worker. Right. So is that something that you're hoping you know, to, to, to see um, yes. you know, in this budget announcement that's going to be announced later on? Yes, that's right. We okay. To well, see that. Walter, you know, let's talk about this CPF system because you know, it came up, right? The Enhanced Retirement Sum ERS, it will be increased to $426,000 next year. 
um, you know, uh, DPM Wong mentioned moves to rationalize the CPF system. We're starting next year. The government will close, you know, mm -hmm. end it, right? The special account for those aged 55 and above. The um, SA savings will then be transferred to your retirement account and the remaining SA savings will then be transferred to your OA account, your ordinary account. What's your take on this rationale to change the system? How will this affect or perhaps, you know, benefit mm -hmm. members then? So, you know, I think there were two broad reasons to change it. And one was actually a loophole, unfortunately, uh, which is that there were some, some CPF members out there with large balances. What they were doing is they were actually investing their special accounts before they hit 55 in order to drain it. Why would they do that? Because when they hit 55, the retirement account would be created. It would have to be funded by the ordinary account because they, you know, used up the money in their special account. And then they would put the money back in the SA afterwards. Why? To actually put a large amount of money at a higher interest rate under both your SA and the RA. And this is not intended. Shielding, yes, right? the shielding, yeah. yeah. And this is not intended because it only benefited a very small segment of the population, very high income individuals. It wasn't really a policy intent. So I think uh, removing this loophole is probably a good thing. Uh, but the other reason why this move is important is that there are also some uh, CPF members out there who have got money in their special accounts uh, and they didn't transfer it to their retirement account. Maybe they didn't realize, they didn't notice. Because of that, they might be getting lower retirement account payouts or CPF life payouts than they're entitled to. Mm. And so I think for those people, moving it into the correct account is a good thing. It will help to boost their retirement payouts a small amount. So I think that's good as well. Well, then, Lashmi, you were also saying, you know, we were talking earlier as well about, you know, the CPF enhancements for the um, as seniors, you know. Yes. What's your take? You know, was that something that you were hoping to hear and yes, it was announced? Certainly. Certainly. Uh, again, NTUC uh, as I advocated for increase in CPF uh, percentage point for people who are 55 and above, and uh, it came true. So we hope that it will not stop at 1.5%. Uh, it, it, you know, it will gradually improve further. You know, our, uh, our take is that we hope to have at 37% for 55 to 60, mm. and probably a, a lot more, more than 22% for those who are uh, 60 and above. All right, no, thank you so much for your analysis for that. You know, we've talked about skills future, but barely scratching the surface. Don, I'm sure your guests are also thinking about it. Glenda, they certainly have been. And let's get to them right now with that. Ang uh, a substantial boost for skills future. I'm sure it's the topic of uh, many people's conversations right now in Singapore, especially for those aged 40 and above. I mean, anecdotally, this is a tough one because we, we know anecdotally many people who have benefited from Skills Future, and we also know of the stories where people don't feel that they've benefited so much. So how much of this enhancement is actually going to address the manpower crunch that you were referencing earlier on? Yeah, I think it's a great question because, um, you know, we were just giving a feedback as an association that a lot of the Skills Future um, training it's not translating into jobs directly. It may be helping people uh, pick up other skills, which is great, right? But from a business perspective, is that translating into to actual real business outcomes in terms of manpower, in terms of workforce? That is something that we don't see. And in the enhancement, we can see that it's going to be more targeted. And that's a great thing because if you are raising the amount of training that's going to be given for people above 40, which is actually the, the area where people are a bit more vulnerable to uh, employment, uh, lack of opportunities, and if you are targeting it and making it more directed towards business outcomes, I think that will result in great, uh, great overall um, outcome for, for the, the workforce as well as SMEs. Uh, of course, the question is what exactly is it? I think that's something that we've got to find out. Yeah, well, yeah, the devil's in the details, yes. right. <laughs> Selina, uh, with more funding for, uh, for workers, they have a lot more to spend. I mean, it's $4,000, but for selected programs as well, I mean, it, 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 it's not just 4000 you can do anything you want with it. Mm. But what should a person, how should they prioritise, rather? How should they prioritise what they choose this, to spend this money on? Well, I think it's great because, you know, $4,000 is actually an eightfold increase from the kind of 500 top-ups that we've seen to the skills future in the past. But curation is important. You know, Angie referred to the link between yeah. the causes and the recognition by employers, whether it's existing or future employers, on the skills that they gain and how relevant is it going to be to the jobs that they perform. 
Yeah. I think we want to basically shy away from, you know, picking mm. up hobbies or, you know, that kind of generalised causes. Mm -hmm. You really want to see curated courses that leads to some form of certification or qualification that's recognised and that's going to be useful and relevant. In your mind, Selena, does that leap in, in the quantum from the $500 here and $500 there to this $4,000 figure, is it, is it directly reflected in, in what the finance minister may have been listening to on the ground with Forward Singapore, what, what the feedback was? I think it is probably quite pertinent. I mean, uh, $500 probably gets you a couple of hours, maybe a half a day or one day course. $4,000 can be pitched at a much more technical or higher knowledge level. Uh, it can be possibly, you know, affording you training by industry experts itself. So I think it's important uh, that we draw the distinction and you get a lot more leeway, I would say, with $4,000. All right. We also have changes with uh, we also have changes with corporate tax. We also have changes with corporate tax receipts. They remain the largest segment uh, collected by the Inland Revenue Authority. Now, out of 68.6 billion dollars in tax revenue that was collected in the 2023 financial year, over 23 billion dollars was from corporations. Now, Singapore has a flat corporate tax rate of 17%, but firms, they can pay less than due to a, a, a range of tax reliefs as well as other incentives that are in place. But that is about to change next year, 2025, for large multinational enterprises, otherwise known as MNEs, that are earning above a certain amount. They must pay a global minimum tax rate of 15%, from 2025 to align with international rules. And what this means is, if a foreign company pays 10% tax here in Singapore, the remaining 5% could be levied in its home jurisdiction. Another way is for this same company to pay a top-up tax to the minimum 15% global rate to Singapore tax authorities. Now, as it stands, Singapore's current rate is in, is in the company of the financial centers like Hong Kong. This is much more than the Swiss, but still some way from Australia and one of the highest rates. Singapore's tax rate is the lowest ever and has been steadily declining over the past two decades. In 1997, it was 26%. That was before hitting the current rate in 2010. All right, let's get back to my guest now. Selena, this new change uh, would, how far does it affect our, comp our competitiveness with other jurisdictions? Well, you know, looking at our key competitors and also our key source markets for investments, you're talking about the UK, you're talking about uh, Korea, Hong Kong and the lights, they are all implementing Pillar 2 either uh, this year or next year. So it's going to be a fairly level playing field in that sense. And so Singapore really has to jump on the bandwagon, so to speak. But I thought what was important was his point that actually Singapore will see no net gains uh, from this tax regime change. So I guess, you know, from here, uh, it still comes down to the overall investment climate for Singapore. It's not just about taxes, it's not just about cost, but also about uh, the other attractions of, you know, uh, you know, investments and companies operating in Singapore. So whether it's manpower, uh, whether it's in terms of our transparency, our efficiencies, our law and order, all these still have to play a very, very important role. Yeah, I um, mean, Singapore's asset ratio uh, is still solid, and that is an important reason why we have our AAA rating. That alone keeps us competitive in terms of the list of priorities that MNCs may have in choosing to headquarter here in Singapore in the first place. Uh, what about for the impact on businesses, on local enterprises, uh, when it comes to uh, complying with the, uh, the, the, the new global tax rules? I mean, uh, lots of people in those companies may be Singaporeans. Yeah, I think the concern is, um, of course, the global tax rule doesn't directly impact the local SMEs. Mm -hmm. But I think the concern is whether uh, if there's a shift in how the global companies are domiciling and they, they have uh, moved out, then they'll have knock-on effects on our businesses and revenues for us and business. And I think that's something that we are concerned about. All right. Thank you very much for that, Selena and Angyut. Well, let's... 
Yeah, well, Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong warns that the world will become more violent and fragmented in the years to come. But he believes that Singapore can emerge stronger as long as it stays united, works together and keeps faith. DPM Wong recalled a school visit that he made during the pandemic. One student, Levin Ong, wrote, and I quote, Dear future Levin, I hope you have been well in these past 10 years. I'm grateful for how Singapore is dealing with COVID-19. The challenges I face are small compared to others during this difficult time. I want the world to be a better place and contribute back to society to the best of my ability. I hope by 2030, I have made a better world for everyone. Hope for the future, giving back to society, each one of us doing our best to make this a better place for all. That's what this is about. Mr. Speaker, let us draw inspiration from young Singaporeans like Levin, move forward with confidence and build our shared future together. Sir, I beg to move. Budget 2024 looked to tackle both immediate challenges and also to help Singapore pursue and capture longer term growth and those jobs. This is only the first step in putting in place plans laid out in the Forward Singapore Roadmap. Our thanks to all our guests who've been with us today and offered their expert analysis. And thank you for watching and for joining us. Join us later. We're on Singapore tonight. That's later at 10 p.m. where we're going to continue our in-depth look at these measures. Bye for now.